Good evening, everyone. So let's start with the first topic of the discussion. That is going to be a TB, which I have left out in the afternoon session. So TB, you all know tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. You are going to have a, a TNF alpha, uh, which is going to be increased, which causes interleukins to increase and which is going to cause ultimately GONS focus is going to be formed in your lung and that is going to lead to fibrosis. So we have certain drugs that are going to help in inhibiting your bacterial growth, bacterial development as well as which are going to inhibit this inflammatory uh, reactions occurring in your lungs. Okay, the TB, you're going to have the first line of drug, remember, that is going to be just HRZE. I'm not sure whether you have an updated book in your uh, hand. So the update of 2023 by the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program is we are now not considering streptomycin as a drug for the first line of TB uh, the TB treatment okay it was before and it was going for when i was studying it was hrze yes now it is hrze is the first line of treatment so what are the important thing so hrze is nothing but your rifampicin isoniazide you're going to have your pyrid uh, you're going to have your uh, pyridoxin and ethambutol so these are the drugs which are going to be acting in the anti-tubercular regimen so this is going to be your anti-tubercular regimen uh, which nowadays it is followed so you are going to remember isoniazide rifampicin then you are going to have your pyrenzamide then ethambutol so streptomycin nowadays it is not considered as the treatment or drug of choice in the first line of TB management. So what are the important things you are going to remember among them? Rifampicin causes orange color urine. So the side effect of uh, treating with rifampicin is you are going to get an orange color urine. So whenever you are going to prescribe your patient with rifampicin, you are going to explain the patient that when the rifampicin is taken, there will be orange color new urine. And second thing is going to be isoniazid. This isoniazid is going to be metabolized by your acetylation. I already told you ship drugs, sulfonamide, hydralazine, isoniazide, procainamide, all are going to be metabolized by acetylation. Can someone respond in the chat box in the morning? I told you what is going to be the problem arised because of the acetylation. Can someone tell me what is the problem arising due to acetylation and what uh, in which disease you have to prevent giving these acetylation drugs? Can you respond? No, I am asking you in which uh, disease per se we will be not prescribing acetylation drugs like your sulfonamide, isoniazide uh, and your uh, hydralazin and your procainamide. Excellent, Afif, it is SLE. So SLE, it is contraindicated. Why? Because these drugs will also cause a eruption, skin eruptions, which is very similar to that of your SLE. And they will be worsening the rashes that is present in your systemic lupus erythematosus. That is the reason why we are avoiding these uh, ship drugs in your SLE. Clear? So SLE, la, drug induced SLE is one condition that is caused because of this ship drug. And coming to the pyridoxin deficiency, remember, so since there is an inhibition of pyridoxal phosphokinase by your drug pyranzamide, so that is going to lead to sideroblastic anemia. And ethambutol causes optic neuritis. That's another important point you're going to remember. So most hepatotoxic, among the first line drug which is most hepatotoxic, it is going to be a pyranamide. So your isoniazin and rifampicin followed by. Then you have the renal safe drug is going to be rifampicin. You know that rifampicin is going to be uh, excreted okay, by bile secretions. It is not going to be uh, going out in the, okay, it is not going out in your urine. That is one thing. So it is a renal safe and rifabutane will be causing a pseudo jaundice and pan uveitis. So the either one the LRMA you will be able to write. But where we will all miss is the second line of drugs. So it will be very difficult to memorize the second line of drugs. I have made it very simple. All the second line anti-tubercular drugs. So let's remember like in the name of PET cycle. PET cycle. P stands for PASS. Okay. And E stands for ethambutol. T stands for thioacetazone. And CY stands for cycloserin. Other C stands for clofazamine and you have your L stands for linezolin and E stands for ethionamide. So among them, what is important? 
So you have something called as theoacetazone. This theoacetazone is contraindicated in HIV, you have to remember. And all are going to be second line drug except your ethambutol. Ethambutol is not second line of drug. Ethambutol is not second line of drug. Ethambutol will be the first line of drug, okay? So among this, all are second line of drug except your ethambutol. Ethambutol will be first line drug. All are going to be anti-tubercular, bacteriostatic in nature. They are not bacteriocidal. They are bacteriostatic in nature. So you have clofazamine, which is going to cause ichthyosis. That is one of the side effects. And ethionamide will be causing hypothyroid goiter. So is it clear? So you are just going to revise along with me. So these are the bacteriostatic anti-tubercular drug, which you are going to remember. Again, I repeat, it is PET cycle. P stands for PASS and E stands for ethambutol. T stands for theoacetazone. CY stands for cycloserin. C stands for your clofazamine. L stands for linezolid and E stands for ethionamide. So these are the bacteriostatic anti-tubercular drug except your ethambutol among them. All are going to be second line drugs. Is it clear guys? Next, what are the drugs which you are going to use in the MDRTB? So next question that you are going to answer is going to be what are the drugs that you are going to use in the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis? Remember, when you call it a multi-drug resistant, when there is going to be isoneoside along with isoneoside rifampicin resistant only then you call it as a MDRTB. What are the drugs you are going to remember here? BDP. Remember BDP. B stands for bidaquilin, D stands for dilemanid and P stands for pritomanid. So these are the updated um, updated according to the NTEP 2023 guidelines. Bidaquilin, they will be inhibiting what? MYC ATP synthase. So MYC mycobacterial ATP synthase is going to be inhibited by your bidaquilin. And what is the role of dilamanide? Dilamanide is going to inhibit the mycolic acid present in the cell membrane. And you have your pritomanid. Pritomanid, again manid. Manid knowledge, they are going to inhibit the mycolic acid. Okay, they are going to inhibit the mycolic acid. So these are the three drugs that are used exclusively in the MDRTB. So when you call, when you have a MDRTB, okay, you are going to remember isoneazide rifampicin resistance. When do you call it as a XDRTB? Okay, XDRTB, when you are going to have a MDR, that is isoneazide rifampicin deficiency, Along with that, you have deficiency or you are you're going to have a resistance for the fluoroquinolone and you have a resistance for the aminoglycoside. So, isoneazide rifampicin uh, resistance. Along with that, you are going to have fluoroquinolones. Along with that, you are going to have aminoglycoside. When all these four drugs are going to be resistant, then you call it as a XDRTB. Clear? So, these are the drugs that are going to be used in the MDRTB. Now, a uh, few lines about each and everything. Bidaquilin. Bidaquilin, remember, they will be blocking the ATP synthase. Okay. They are bacteriocidal in nature. They are long acting. So, note it down. These are the points which you need to understand, which you are going to memorize. Apart from that, you don't waste time in memorizing all the drugs. Okay. All the drugs because you already know each and every type of drug and its mechanism when we were discussing about the antimicrobial. For your, when you're going to specifically target one specified disease or like your tuberculosis, leprosy, syphilis, you're just going to tell what the drug it is, what is the mechanism of action, what is the contraindication and what is going to be the adverse effect in it. So when you're going to talk about your bidaquilin, they are going to block the ATP synthase. They are bacteriocidal in nature, long acting. So they are going to cause QT prolongation. As you have seen many antimicrobials, we have discussed so far is going to have this QT prolongation. Can you tell me any other disease where we or any other drug which causes QT prolongation? We have discussed so many drugs in antimicrobial from the morning. Can someone respond in the chat box, Kavita, Peef and others, those who participated in the morning session? Can you just name at least two drugs which causes increase in the QT prolongation? Can you at least name at least two drugs which causes QT prolongation? Ciprofloxin. Do you want to tell ciprofloxin, Kavita? If you do, you want to tell ciprofloxin. Ciprofloxin, so you know, la. Or sparfloxacin, exactly, very good. But sparfloxacin we are not using nowadays. So it is going to cause an increase in the QT prolongation. Excellent, sparfloxacin morning I told. But this sparfloxacin is going to increase QT, uh, but it is now not currently utilized or not currently used. Can you tell me some other drug which is currently in use and they have QT prolongation, which is going to be currently in use and they are causing QT prolongation. Can you tell? 
chloroquine excellent so chloroquine is one drug which is going to be used currently and they have an increase in the qt prolongation can some other drug can you recall some other drug from your uh, from your protein synthesis inhibitor from the from that part protein synthesis inhibitor part can you recall and tell me one drug which is going to cause a qt prolongation let me see who is going to get that correct QT prolongation, which is going to be a part of your uh, nucleic uh, uh, protein synthesis inhibitor. Among the protein synthesis inhibitor, you are going to have one that is going to cause QT prolongation. A common drug which we are using, a common drug which we are using, every now and then the uh, general medicine practitioner will be writing that drug. Azithromycin, excellent, very good. Azithromycin as well as your erythromycin, they are going to have increase in the QT uh, uh, length or QT prolongation. So, QT, QT, what is QT basically? Can someone tell me what is QT? What is QRS complex? Do you know? A basics of ECG. QRS complex is going to be denoting your ventricular depolarization. And your ST segment is going to denote your ventricular repolarization. Okay, well, ventricular repolarization. Aba QT interval, it is going to tell you about both your re depolarization. And you all know that there is a phase 1, phase 0, phase 1, phase 2. So, on the phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, the moon may in your uh, contraction of your heart. These three are going to be considered as a QT prolongation. The time taken for your ventricle to contract is going to be more. So that is going to be your side effect. But what is a contraindication? You are going to contraindicate this bidaquilin in arrhythmia. Now coming to the delonamide. Delonamide, they are free nitro anion uh, radical production. Okay, wow. so they are going to be again bacteriocidal in nature. High plasma binding protein. They also have this QT prolongation and contraindication is going to be arrhythmia. And coming to pritomanid, pritomanid is going to be again free nitro anion radical production. They are contraindicated, the liver failure. I told you that these drugs are going to be excreted by the uh, liver. Okay, they are going to be excreted by your liver. Therefore, you are going to have this uh, contraindication in the liver failure. Okay, others I am not going to discuss other MCQs. So, this alone I have left out. So, I have discussed in the uh, in the pretext of a MCQ. Now, we are going to go into... Uh, Okay, now we are going to move into the next topic. We have almost completed the entire uh, discussion of your uh, antimicrobial. Now I am going to enter into the next important drug, the important group of drugs that is going to be your central nervous system. We are going to talk about the central nervous system. Are you all ready to discuss about the central nervous system? Yes. So when you are going to start with the central nervous system, most commonly we will start with this drug called as migraine. Okay, first important where we will start, we will start with the discussion on migraine. Okay, so migraine, it is going to be why, can you tell me why a migraine occurs? Can someone tell me why a migraine occurs? Any idea why there is a migraine? So any idea why there is a migraine? Can someone recall and tell me why there is a migraine in a person? What is the reason for a migraine? Anyone? Can anyone le let me know in the chat box? Any idea, your idea, I am just asking frankly, your idea, what do you think about, uh, what is your idea on your uh, serotonin, okay, your migraine. Migraine means headache that everyone knows. So, migraine is going to be an important question for you in the exam, that is why I am starting with migraine. So, I want you all to answer, what is migraine? Can you all just give your uh, idea about what is migraine in the chat box? Yes. So, vasoconstriction of your meningeal vessels, somewhat very close. See, I'll give you this. So, your migraine when you're going to take, you have a three important uh, theory which is present in our, uh, in our medical textbooks of your Addison. So, the first important theory is going to be a serotonin theory. What they are telling is, there is an excessive production of serotonin. These serotonins are causing vasoconstriction and that is going to lead to headache. This is one kind of theory which is present regarding your migraine. The second theory is going to be about calcitonin gene uh, this, uh, gene related peptide. Okay, calcitonin gene related peptide. So, this calcitonin gene related peptide are going to be excessively synthesized and they are along your trigeminovascular pathway. You all know your past your anatomy, you know where is your trigeminal nerve. So, along the trigeminal nerve and its vascular pathway is this uh, calcitonin gene related peptide is synthesized and that is leading to vasoconstriction. This is a second thought in our Addison textbook. 
third thought is going to be spreading theory so there is a generalized cortical pain that is spreading all around your frontotemporal region these are the three important theories which were given but practically what we are focusing is only on the serotonin theory because serotonin theory has been proved yes it is proved uh, mostly correct by the drugs which we prescribe now moving on to discuss about your migraine remember migraine is nothing but a acute attack okay most commonly it is going to occur in the female 20 it is going to occurring from the childhood what happens is there is a vasoconstriction of the blood vessels that are present all along your trigeminovascular pathway so when there is a, going to be a vasoconstriction what happens there is going to be a decreased blood supply to this trigeminovascular pathway because of it they are telling that there is a pain that is occurring that is not only occurring in your frontal but it is extending to your cheek when someone my experience migraine in this session you will be able to understand that is going to just go down and it is going to present till your cheek the pain will be presenting till your cheek so how we are going to prevent it we are going to prevent it by giving what we are going to prevent it by giving in the, in the case of uh, whenever there is going to be a vasoconstriction, what we are going to do? We are going to give serotonin 1B, 1D agonist. So your serotonin receptors are basically of many types. Among them, we are very much concerned about 5-HT1 receptor. So we know that in general pharmacology, we have discussed there are G-protein coupled receptor. This G-protein coupled receptors are of many types. Among them, we are going to have a G-protein coupled receptor GS. GI and GQ type of receptors. This GI and GS, what they are? They are either stimulant or inhibitor. So here 5-HT1 receptor is an inhibitory type of receptors. So whenever your serotonin comes and acts on it, or a serotonin analog, 5-HT1A, 5-HT1B, 1D, and we have 5-HT1F. So these are the three important receptors that are going to be present. Okay, whenever 5-HT1A agonist comes and sit here, that is going to be a boost piron. Just write it down this classification. I'll explain you in detail everything like what we discussed in the antimicrobial. Follow this flow. Don't get confused with the book flow. Just follow my uh, flow of uh, discussing. That will be helping you. So you have 5-HT1A agonist, 5-HT1B, 1D agonist. Then you have 5-HT1F agonist. Three agonists are there. Among them, we are focusing about the first one, 5-HT1A agonist. The drug which is acting here is going to be your buspiron. Buspiron is going to be an anti-anxiety drug. Buspiron is an anti-anxiety drug. Just leave it aside. Now you are going to have 5-HT1B1D agonist. This is nothing but your triptans. So you are going to call this as a triptans. Triptans are the drug of choice for your migraines. For an acute attack of migraine, what is the drug of choice? It is going to be a triptan group of drugs. So you have variety of triptans. What you have to remember? Okay, remember this is going to be a agonist at 5-HT1B1D. So 5-HT1B1D agonist is it. So it is going to cause vasoconstriction of your cranial blood vessel. So there is a small correction, Revati, I have just forgot to tell you. It is not vasoconstriction of meningeal vessel. It is vasodilatation of meningeal vessel. So serotonin will be causing vasodilatation of meningeal vessel. So what you are going to do? You are going to vasoconstrict the meningeal vessel when you are going to treat the patient. So normally what happens is a vasodilatation. Because of vasodilatation, what happens is, especially venodilatation, I can call it. So because of that, there is a stasis of the blood vessel. When there is going to be a stasis of blood inside the blood vessels, fresh blood is not able to come into it, come into the meningeal vessels. Because of that, there is going to be a reduction in the fresh blood supply to your blood vessels, fresh blood supply to your brain. And that is the reason why you are going to get a headache. Clear, right? Along the trigeminovascular pathway, there is going to be stasis of blood. Why? Because of vasodilatation of blood vessel. So what you will be doing is, you are going to correct it by giving a vasoconstrictors. So what are the vasoconstrictors you are going to give your, so you are going to give triptans. Triptans are nothing but they are going to act on this 5-HT1B1D receptor. In this 5-HT1B1D receptor, they are going to go, they are going to cause vasoconstriction of your cranial blood vessels. Whenever they are going to be vasoconstricting, what happens? There is going to be pushing of blood outside because of that now fresh blood can come inside along the vascular pathway of your trigeminal nerve and that is going to reduce the pain. Is it clear for everyone? This is how your migraine acts. So you have different types of drugs in the triptans. So the most common or the drug of choice 
is going to be a sumatriptan. The drug of choice which you are going to give in migraine is your sumatriptan. They are going to be acting in the acute attack of migraine. This is going to be given in an acute attack of migraine. Okay. But what are the other drugs? We have some other drugs too. For example, if you want to give a slow acting drug in a chronic migraine patient, you want to give a slow acting drug, you are going to go for a frovatriptan. So slow act pannuna, frovatriptan. What fast act pannuna, what is the drug you are going to give? Rosatriptan. See here, the drug of choice is sumatriptan. The drug of choice which you are going to give here is sumatriptan. What is going to be the fast acting drug which you are going to give? That is rosatriptan. Fast acting drug is going to be rosatriptan. What is the slow acting drug? Provatriptan. Then you are going to have the futuristic drug. Now it has come forward. That is elitriptan. Elitriptan is also a fast acting drug. Elitriptan is also a fast acting drug. E kapra F. So elitriptan is going to be fast acting drug. And you are going to have intranasal drug. Intranasal drug is going to include sumatriptan and zolmitriptan. The one important thing here you are going to understand is one important thing here you are going to understand is sumatriptan is given an oral nasal or subcutaneous. Sumatriptan is not given in the IV or IM route. It is given only in subcutaneous route. Only injectable triptan is going to be a sumatriptan. That sumatriptan is also going to be in the subcutaneous route only. You cannot give in any other route. This is one point I want you all to remember. Clear, right? Then coming towards your nasal, you have your zolmitriptan. This zolmitriptan is going to be a ergot and triptan. Okay, so it's going to be a zolmitriptan is a er uh, triptan group of drugs. Here you can also go for a ergot derivative, which I am going to come later today. I am going to discuss about. So that ergot derivative should not be added with your triptans because both are going to cause vasodilatation to vasoconstriction. When there is a severe vasoconstriction, that is also going to lead to problem. Therefore, you will never add ergots with triptan. Is my speed is clear? Is my speed is okay for you all? Is my explanation clear? If you have any doubt, can you put in the chat box? Or at least if you are listening, can you put a thumbs up in the chat box so that I can be assured that you are all along with me. So we are just moving forward to your central nervous system. First, I have introduced with your serotonin receptor. You will see lots and lots of receptor from now on. Okay, first receptor is your 5-HT1 receptor, which I am discussing. Is it clear for everyone? Can you put a thumbs up in the chat box? Okay, so now we are going to have this triptan group of drugs. This triptan group of drugs, the problem with these triptans are, the problem which you are going to face with the triptan are, they are going to be causing hypotension. They are going to be causing hypotension. They will be having a pain in the neck and jaw. And you all know that it is a strong vasoconstrictor. So that is not going to constrict only your, only your meningeal vessels or your trigeminovascular pathway which is dilated, but it is going to cause a vasoconstriction in entire system in your entire body, what that will cause? That will lead to uncontrolled hypertension. So it is going to cause a constriction of your blood vessel all over your body that causes uncontrolled hypertension. And also what is going to, the other problem you're going to face here, you're going to face here is, there is going to be a constriction of the blood vessel that is supplying your heart. So that leads to angina. It can lead to myocardial infraction. That is going to be the second important problem you have. Third important problem is when there is going to be vasoconstriction along your trigeminal pathway beyond a limit, that will also cause a pain in the neck and jaw. These are the three important side effects which you are going to have. Now coming towards your, uh, you are now coming towards the last part. That is going to be, what is going to be your last meat and last meat return is nothing but it is the 5-HT1 help agonist. It is going to be 5-HT1F agonist. It is going to be a last meat hidden. Last meat hidden is also given in case of uh, acute attack of migraine. But what is the importance of this last meat hidden? So whenever we are upgrading a drug, for example, from a sumatriptan to your last meat hidden. So what we will be not what we will be changing? The one which we had problem in the previous drug have to be rectified. Similarly, in your sumatriptan, the problem which we had is going to be a cause of MI. So it is going to lead to MI. So what we did is, we are going to go into a specific to your trigeminal pathway that is going to be your 5-HT1F agonist. So we are going to target 5-HT1F agonist alone because of that what happens, there is going to be a uh, prevention of MI 
me by using this last minute error. Is it clear? This is all about your last minute error. Now, what are the profile axis of chronic migraine? Remember the profile axis of chronic migraine. This also can be asked as a short note for you. Profile axis of chronic migraine. Remember A, B, C. A stands for antidepressants. A stands for antidepressants. And B stands for botulinum toxin. Hope you took a screenshot, right? Hope you have copied. Everyone, take a screenshot of this. Hope everyone copied this. Shall I move towards the next one? Yeah, I'll go to my notes itself directly. Okay, just hold on. Ah, so see here, now you're going to have this. This is what uh, we, are, we are seeing. See, you're going to have a, a hypertension and a IHD and in pregnancy, you're going to contraindicate these three drugs. So in a pregnancy, what is going to be the migraine drug that you can give? You can go with the last minute done. Last minute done is going to be given in the pregnancy. Now coming to the next one, that is going to be your ergotamine. So ergotamine or partial agonist. Okay, they are partial agonist of 5-HT1B1D. For 5-HT1B1D, ergotamine is going to be a partial agonist. They are going to act as a D2 agonist and they are going to act as an alpha blocker. So, moon important on of problems you are going to have in your ergotamine. What are they? One, they are going to cause partial agonistic action in your 5-HT1B1D. They are going to be a D2 agonist and they are going to be alpha blocker. What is the importance of it? They are partial agonist. Because they are partial agonist, one of the advantages, they are going to help in against your migraine. They are going to be alpha blocker. So alpha blocker causes vasodilatation in the peripheral blood vessel. Okay. Right. So let me continue. See here, you are going to have your last minute done, which is going to be a 5-HT1F agonist, which is safe in IHD and safe in the case of pregnancy. You are going to give even in the case of pregnancy. Then we were discussing about ergotamine. Ergotamine is nothing but they are ergot derivatives. They are ergot derivatives and they are partial agonists 5-HT1B1D. This is going to cause vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction of the vessels along your vessels along the trigeminovascular pathway, along the trigeminovascular pathway. That is the first thing you are going to remember. Second thing, they are going to be D2 agonists and alpha blocker. Alpha blocker will be helping in vasodilatation of peripheral vessels, of peripheral vessels. Okay, this is the reason why ergotamine is going to be a preferred drug. Okay, you can give ergotamine as a preferred drug for the, uh, for your, uh, what to say, for your migraine. Now, coming on to discuss about the profile axis of migraine. So, remember A, B, C. A stands for antidepressants. So, you are going to give antidepressant. What antidepressant? You are going to give amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is going to be a drug of choice in case of your migraine profile axis. Second thing is going to be your anti-epileptic drug. So, remember Togawa. Anti-epileptic, what you are going to remember? Togawa. Tog stands for your topiramate. Ga stands for your gabapentin. And Va stands for your valproate. So, topiramate, gabapentin, valproate. They are going to be useful in the profile axis. They are going to be useful in the profile axis of migraine. Okay. This is the second thing which you are going to remember. Third uh, okay, drug is going to be your beta blockers. So, beta blockers, propranolol is a drug of choice. Then comes your botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is going to be another drug which you are going to give. So, now A is over, B is over. In C, you are going to have three drugs. So, A, you are going to have two drugs. B, you are going to have two drugs. And C, you are going to have three drugs. What are the three drugs? Calcium channel blockers, candy sartan, and CGP, uh, CGRP inhibitor. I told you, right, calcitonin gene-related peptide can also be. There is one theory that calcitonin gene-related peptide is one of the cause for migraine. Therefore, we are inhibiting the calcitonin gene-related peptide. So, how we are, what is going to be the action? They are going to be released from the trigeminal neuron and spinal cord. They are highly potent vasodilator. So, what we are doing is, we are going to inhibit this CGPR. Okay, we are going to inhibit this calcitonin gene-related peptide. Similarly, calcium channel blockers like your verapamil, diltiazem, plunarizin, they are going to be acting as a potent vasodilator. Then we have candy sartan, which is also going to be. What is candy sartan? Can someone respond in the chat box? What is candy sartan? What group of drug it is? Irbi sartan, candy sartan, or Maximum anticholinergic side effect. They are going to have a maximum anticholinergic side effect. They are going to increase QT interval and they are going to cause retinopathy.
clear now i always tell this and eps eps nu maga padipenga so extra pyramidal symptom understand what is extra pyramidal symptom a 40 year old male coming to schizof coming with schizophrenia and you are going to admit the patient okay you are going to start with the aloperidol all of the sudden at less than one week the patient will be developing some muscle okay the patient is going to develop muscle spasm there is going to be a face neck eye spasm what is that symptom what is that uh, what is that uh, symptoms or signs called as that is going to be your acute dystonia so what are the effects of aloperidol i am discussing if you write like this in your exam definitely you are going to get a good mark for aloperidol short note or essay so you are going to have a 40 year old male with schizophrenia and you know that it is a first generation uh, antipsychotic is going to be aloperidol aloperidol fluoxetine pimoxidine so you are going to prescribe the patient with aloperidol less than one week what happens the patient is going to have a muscle spasm face neck eye what is going to be your uh, diagnosis acute dystonia it is a side effect of aloperidol so now what i am discussing is a side effect of aloperidol how will you treat this you will go for a central anticholinergic i told you that they are going to be anti they are going to be due to excessive ach acetylcholine so what you are going to do you are going to block the acetylcholine receptor so central anticholinergic example is going to be a benzexol so we have we will discuss tomorrow about that uh, uh, your uh, alpha blockers beta blockers muscarinic nicotinic we will have it at the end so we will be discussing it tomorrow but now remember central anticholinergic example is going to be a benzexol and antihistamine h1 blockers first generation also use diphenhydramine do you remember diphenhydramine dimenhydrinate these are the two antihistamine h1 blockers okay you know and now coming towards one to four weeks in one to four weeks what happens is there is going to be a restlessness there will be a restlessness do you know why there is a restlessness why there is a restlessness because of rise in the acetylcholine okay what it will do is it is going to cause what it is also going to cause what can you can you just recall and tell me what happens when there is a increase in acetylcholine there it is going to lead to it is going to lead to a what is clonazepam and what is propranolol propranolol is a beta blocker so what happens whenever there is a rise in the acetylcholine on the long run on the long run you are also going to have a problem in you are also going to have a problem in beta receptors just give me a minute i am getting a call just over. okay so you are going to have something called as uh, beta receptors will also get stimulated so because of beta receptors getting stimulated especially which beta receptors they are going to get stimulated either beta receptors or they can also get stimulating your they can also get stimulating your alpha 2 receptors okay so do you remember which one will be causing a restlessness tremor can you just recall and tell me which uh, receptor will be causing restlessness tremor okay so in the receptor la when there is going to be increased uh, that will be leading to restlessness and tremor it is going to be a beta 2 receptors so what happens in the beta 2 it is going to be when it is going to be receptors present in your skeletal muscle in your skeletal muscle you will ask me acetylcholine is going to be related to only your so you will always think acetylcholine you will be thinking your uh, uh, parasympathetic nervous system or cholinergic system but remember acetylcholine will also stimulate on the long run your beta 2 receptors and it is going to it is going to stimulate your skeletal muscle and that is going to lead to restlessness the patient what they will do is they will constantly pacing they will constantly tap their feet they will be be restless so that is going to due to akathisia that is called as akathisia what is going to be a drug of choice that propranolol is going to be the drug of choice clonazepam can also be given because clonazepam are cns depressants cns depressants now you are going to have in 1 to 4 months if you are going to have a muscle rigidity you are going to have tremor you can have bradykinesia all these are symptoms of drug induced parkinsonism so what you are going to do now you are going to you will be thinking that okay i have diagnosed parkinsonism now what will be your immediate drug of choice you will go for l dopa that is going to be levodopa but remember levodopa is not effective so what you will go for you go for central anticholinergic already we discussed one central anticholinergic can you name in the chat box what is the already discussed central anticholinergic revathi kavita can someone put in the chat box what is the central anticholinergic we discussed in the case of face disto face dystonia or acute dystonia what is the treatment of choice we told for acute dystonia 
what is the drug we gave central anticholinergic can you name it come on can you name in the chat box what is the central anticholinergic we discussed in the uh, phase dystonia or acute dystonia condition acute dystonia what is the drug of choice acute dystonia what is the drug of choice can you put in the chat box come on very good it's a benzexol so benzexol is going to be one of the central anticholinergic similarly you're going to have amantadine amantadine is other anti central acting anticholinergic which is used in the drug induced parkinsonism when it is going to be more than six months or years what happens there will be abnormal movements chewing puffing all this thing will be there so this is called as tardative dyskinesia so why because of super sensitivity for the d2 receptors so what you're going to do when there's a super sensitivity to d2 receptors what happens so when you're going to give more do when you're going to give uh you're going to give what you're going to give a dopamine inhibitor so you're going to give a d2 inhibition because of that it uh, because of that what happens even a small amount of dopamine when it is going to be present that is going to cause a super sensitivity that leads to chewing and puffing movements so what you're going to do you're going to give a dopamine depleter what are the dopamine depleters you know that is your vesicular monoamine transporter if you just go back quickly what happens is your body is going to give tyrosine to the neurons this tyrosine is going to get converted into a dopa by tyrosine hydroxylase this dopa is going to get converted into dopamine okay this dopamine okay it has to enter into the vesicles in order to get out of your neuron that vesicle entry is going to be done by vesicular monoamine transporter only when they are going to enter into the vesicular monoamine transporter they can be exiting out or they can move into your noradrenaline they can get converted to your epinephrine here that vesicular monoamine transporter is going to be inhibited okay how you are going to inhibit by the welbenzine and your tetrabenzene welbenzine and tetrabenzene are the group of drugs that are going to inhibit your vmat vesicular monoamine transporter now coming to any time so you're going to have your muscular rigidity and increase in hyperthermia for that you're going to use nare you're going to use narendra modi manmohan singh okay remember like that nms narendra modi manmohan singh so the n stands for neuroleptic m stands for malignant s for first syndrome that is neuroleptic malignant syndrome so what are going to be the side effects now can you tell me the side effects of your uh, extra pyramidal symptoms like nna symptom varla number one acute dystonia number one you're going to have acute dystonia number two akathisia number three drug induced parkinsonism number four tardive dyskinesia so tardive dyskinesia and number five is going to be neuroleptic malignant syndrome atypical antipsychotic clozapine what is the mechanism of action of your clozapine can someone tell me what is the mechanism of action of clozapine come on guys you can you can answer very good 5h2a 5ht2a receptor excellent answer 5ht2a receptor that is going to be your uh, uh, action mechanism of action of clozapine okay and it is also going to act on d2 okay it is also going to act on d2 as a inhibitor d2 inhibitor it is going to have more on the 5 ht2a inhibition so what are the side effects of it number one it is going to cause a a granulocytosis it is going to cause close up pain it is going to cause a granulocytosis okay then you are going to have this close up pain a granulocytosis is not a dose related and you need not add any other bone marrow suppressant so don't add any other bone marrow suppressant like your carbamazepine so we will discuss about your carbamazepine in a few uh, when we are going to discuss about the central nervous system drugs so carbamazepine is also a uh, going to cause a bone marrow suppression therefore you will not add carbamazepine along with your close up pain similarly seizures so they are going to cause seizures therefore what you're going to do you're going to ask seizure history before prescribing with the uh, close up pain and what is the next one you're going to go for the it is going to cause sedation remember close up pain also causes sedation then you have cialuria so it is going to cause cialuria what is cialuria can you tell me what is cialuria what is the meaning of cialuria can you respond in the chat box what is cialuria what is cialuria anyone Cialuria is nothing but hypersalivation, excessive drooling of saliva. So cialuria will be there. That is going to be a side effect of clozapine. And finally, you are there is going to be a weight gain. Weight gain will be maximum in case of clozapine than the olanzapine. Now coming to the use. Where will you use this atypical antipsychotic? In any case of resistant schizophrenia, 
or any case where there is a resistance to the first generation antipsychotic, you are going to move towards the second generation antipsychotic, especially your close up end. Okay, second thing is going to be they are going to give you anti suicidal thought. So, just not antipsychotic, they are going to act as antidepressants also. They will be helpful in anti suicidal thoughts. Okay, suicide thought and then the prevent pandra thing this is going to help. What are the other drug that is going to be useful in the suicide thinking patient? That is going to be your lithium. So, lithium as well as your uh, okay, as well as your close up ends are going to be given in the patient with schizophrenia. Now, moving on to talk about the olanzapine. What is olanzapine? Olanzapine they will not cause so it's like a same like a close up end, but the thing is they will not cause bone marrow suppression. We had a problem with your clonus of close up in that it has a bone marrow suppression. Here it is going to be your no granulocytosis, no bone marrow suppression. But this will also have a weight gain. But weight gain is maximum with close up in than olanzapine. Close up in is going to be having a more weight gain than your olanzapine. Why? Because they are going to inhibit your okay, they are going to inhibit your uh, 5-HT receptors. Okay, it is going to inhibit your histamine receptors. That is going to be the main cause of weight gain than your 5-HT2C inhibition. Now coming to the third one, they are used in the chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. I'll discuss about this chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting in detail when we are talking about your uh, autocoids. I'll discuss separately your topic autocoids. So that time you will be able to understand. For now what you are going to remember is this olanzapine. So clozapine is completed. Clozapine is going to have a more bone marrow suppression. They are going to cause seizures. They have sedation and they will be having celoria and weight gain. So other than we prevent pandra olanzapine la olanzapine is an improvement of clozapine. They are not going to have bone marrow suppression. They are not going to have a bone marrow suppression. Now coming to the quitiapine. So quitiapine is a Q for quick. Remember like that. Quitiapine Q for quick. They are going to have a short acting. They are going to be very quick. And they are going to also have in addition to 5-HT2A inhibition. They are going to have a strong inhibitor of histamine receptors also. Since they are going to be a strong action on histamine. What is the one which you get when you are going to put citrusin? Can you tell me what happens when you are going to put citrusin? Or when you are going to put Montelukast uh, citrusin, Montec LC? What happens? You are going to have a sedation. Same way here also you are going to have sedation when you are going to take VT apine. Third is going to be a risperidone. Risperidone is going to be the fourth drug which you are going to talk in the atypical antipsychotic. First is going to be a clozapine. Second we have talked about the olanzapine. Third we are going to talk about the quitiapine. Quitiapine is going to be a quick and short. Strong H1 we have completed. Fourth is going to be a risperidone. Remember along with your 5-HT2A inhibition and dopamine inhibition. Along with 5-HT2A inhibitor and a dopa D2 inhibitor, they are also going to cause what? They are also going to cause inhibition of D3. They are also going to cause inhibition of T3. So they have the maximum extrapyramidal symptom among your all your atypical antipsychotic. Among your atypical antipsychotic, you know that atypical antipsychotic will have a reduction in the extrapyramidal symptoms. But among the atypical antipsychotic, the one which is going to have maximum extrapyramidal symptom is going to be your rosperidone. Okay, rosperidone is going to have the 5-HT2A inhibition and D2 inhibition. They have a maximum hyperprolactinemia. Where there is going to be EPS symptom, there you are going to also have hyperprolactinemia. How you are going to prevent, how you are going to, uh, okay, how you are going to have a maximum hyperprolactinemia. Now tell me what is the other drug that is going to cause maximum hyperprolactinemia, right? then and there itself amisulfide amisulfiride is a group of drug that is going to cause inhibition of not only your d2 receptor but it is going to inhibit your d3 receptors also when there is inhibition of both the receptors that is going to cause hyperprolactinemia maximum hyperprolactinemia among your antipsychotics maximum prolactinemia is caused by your rosperidone respiridone and among the old drug system, old pharmacology, which is going to cause a maximum hyperprolactinemia, that is going to be a amisulfiride. Is it clear? This is going to all about your respiridone. And there was one question which was asked in the INICET exam, AIMS exam. Okay, so these MCQs asked in any set or uh, your need PG that can be replicated in your university paper also. So I want you to learn that that is off-label use of respiridone. You all know that respiridone is used as antipsychotic in your schizophrenia. But remember, it is also used in bipolar disorder. It is also used as a OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And it is also used in your dementia and your delirium. It is also used in dementia and delirium. But in PTSD, P 
PTSD, you don't have any benefit of using Respiridone. Next, we are going to move towards the next one. That is going to be your Ziprasidone. Ziprasidone. So just take your uh, classification book and see. We are just going one by one. Ziprasidone. Ziprasidone, they are going to be very similar to all these things. But a very important point, clinching point of Ziprasidone is they are going to increase the QT interval. They are going to increase the QT interval. Now coming to the next drug, that is Aripiprazole, Aripiprazole, Brexiprazole. So is the end group of drugs may, in addition to the 5-HT2A receptor inhibition, they are going to also have inhibition of your 5-HT1A. So they are going to also act as a partial agonist, not inhibition, they are going to act as a partial agonist of your 5-HT1A. Uh, it is going to be acting as an antagonist or inhibitor of your 5-HT2A and also they are going to act as a partial agonist of D2 receptors. They are going to act as a D2 receptor, they are going to be acting as a agonist. So, they are D2 antagonist or D2 inhibitor. But the only drug, so what you are going to remember about Aripiprazole and your Brexiprazole, the only drug in your antipsychotic that is going to cause a D2 agonist, partial agonist, is going to be your Aripiprazole and Brexiprazole. Clear, right? And the last one which is going to be present is going to be your Cariprazole, Cariprozin. Cariprozin, they are going to be a partial agonist in D2 and D3. So, partial agonist on D2 and D3. Remember, both in Aripiprazole and Cariprazole, we are telling that there is no D2 inhibition. Apart from these two drugs, Cariprazole, Aripiprazole and Brexiprazole, all other antipsychotic, be it first generation or second generation, they are going to inhibit your D2 receptor. Clear, right? What are the uses? What are the uses? What are the uses of all these antipsychotic? Where we are going to use? Number one, in psychosis. In psychosis, the drug of choice is atypical antipsychotic. The first antipsychotic episode, when it is going to be at one to two years. Okay, so one to two years you are going to give when the patient experience. So when I am uh, going to sit in a casualty or in a psychiatric OPD, a patient comes to me and tells that, have you ever seen the three movie? In three movie, what happens? At the end of the movie, there will be two or three characters that is going to come and uh, speak to Dhanush, right? So that is nothing but visual hallucination, auditory hallucination. When you are going, the patient is going to have visual hallucination, auditory hallucination, and all those pos de delusions are there. And there is a negative symptoms like your A social. Just remember Dhanush of three movie. So what happens? He becomes A social. He is going to become a behavior changer. And all those things are going to be the symptoms of schizophrenia. And what is going to be your treatment of choice? So first episode, a patient comes to you, they are going to continue the antipsychotic drug for one to two years. You are going to continue antipsychotic drugs for one to two years. Two years more than one year. So two years, when they are going to ask, the actual range given in the textbook is, Goodman Gill textbook is going to be one to two years. But if they ask you specifically what year, it is two years compared to one year. So two years, you are going to give first antipsychotic episode, then two years, you are going to give antipsychotic drug. Then any subsequent episode, Okay, any subsequent episode, you are going to extend it to 5 years or indefinitely till their lifetime. I have seen a case, so in my own college, a dental college student, he came with a complaint of schizophrenia at around 2 p.m., 2 a.m. So morning 2 a.m. when I was an intern posted in the casualty, I got the patient around 2 a.m. I got a dental student from hostel. He came to me and what is what was his complaint, you know? He was complaining that there was Marvel DC characters that are that, that are surrounding him and that are chasing him. This was a this was a typical history he gave us. So what we did, we have started him with an antipsychotic drug. We have given him with a sleeping dose. So we have given a sleeping uh, dose. We have given so CNS depressants are given for the patient. And since since it's a casualty, we gave a preliminary uh, basic uh, treatment for him. Then we referred to the psychiatric department on the next day. So these type of cases are not unusual. So you will be, uh, oh, you will just uh, come and you will have a case like this. Many times when you are going to work in a casualty, so it's not that only psychiatrist has to know, but a general physician also must know about this psychosis. Okay, now coming to the acute mania. Everyone, everyone, me, you, everyone will be having this maniac episodes. So have you ever uh, wondered, so when you are, there will be a examination, 
So we will be uh, after examination and you're going to pass with distinction. What happens? You will have unexpected excitement in you. That is called as your mania. But when it is going to be become pathologist, when it is going to become pathology, when it is going to be uh, abnormal, excessive excitation, then you call it as acute mania. There, what you're going to give, you're going to give aloperidol. Along with aloperidol, you can also go for lithium. That is going to be your acute mania drug of choice. You can also go for atypical, that is second generation antipsychotic. So anti-emetic. I told you, right, this D2 receptor, it is also present. So this D2 receptor, not only in a psychiatric uh, character, this D2 receptor is also present in the CTZ. CTZ. So whenever there is going to be a increase in the dopamine in your CTZ, what happens? It causes emesis. It causes emesis. So what you can do is, you can give a D2 receptor antagonist or T2 receptor inhibitor like your prochloropresin. This prochloropresin, what happens is, it is going to block your D2 receptor in your CTZ, chemo receptor, uh, okay, zone. Okay, so what happens is, this is going to prevent nausea and vomiting. This is one of the important uh, use in the chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. In a chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, you will be giving chlorpromazin, so as a drug of choice. Clear, right? Now you are going to move towards chorea. What is chorea? Can you can someone put in the chat box what is chorea means? What is chorea meaning? You will be seeing in your pathology, in your uh, rheumatic, uh, in your infective endocarditis, uh, rheumatic fever. In your rheumatic fever, what happens? You have the Jones criteria. Under this Jones criteria, you have this chorea also. Okay? You have this chorea also, right? Under Jones criteria, Sidenham's chorea. In your uh, rheumatic fever, Jones, uh, Jones, uh, Jones classification, you will be criteria, you have sedanam scoria. So what will be your drug of choice in that case? So sedanam scoria and rheumatic fever, the drug of choice in your pediatric age group is going to be a valproate. In a adult age group, it's going to be alloperidol. Why I have written pedia arisen? Because your pedia textbook of Nelson gives it as drug of choice is valproate. Whereas your arisen gives us alloperidol. So write it like this, pediatric age group, the drug of choice is going to be valproate. Whereas in adult age group, the drug of choice is alloperidol. Now coming to the Huntington's chorea, Huntington's chorea, the drug of choice is going to be your, so uh, what is the drug of choice? You're going to give tetrabenzene. So you're going to give tetrabenzene. So T-E-T-R-A, tetrabenzene is going to be the drug of choice in case of Huntington's chorea more than your, more than your alloperidol. More than your alloperidol, you're going to go for this drug. Clear, right? This is going to be, come to the end of your antipsychotic drugs. If you have any doubt in antipsychotic drug, you can put in the chat box. Otherwise, we are going to move towards the next one. That is going to be your Parkinson's disease. So, we are going to talk about the Parkinson's disease. See, what happens in your Parkinson's disease? I'll just give you a brief note, guys. Okay, hope you are all, hope I am audible. Is it clear till now? Is everything clear till now? Who are present right now? I think I have given in the YouTube. So many people have left. <laughs> Later they can see in the YouTube. So they have left I think. Revati and Pradap Bala. Are you clear with this? Are you clear with this topics? Till now are you all clear with topics? Shall I go to the next one? The one, the two who are present here. Shall I move towards the next one? Yes. I'll move towards the next one. That is going to be your Parkinson's disease. Remember what happens in your Parkinson's disease. You have something called as substantia nigra. This substantia nigra, you're going to have your dopamine uh, receptor. Okay, you're going to have your dopaminergic nerve fibers that are going to travel and go to your striatum. This is called as nigrostriatal pathway. From your substantia nigra to your striatum, you're going to have nigrostriatal pathway. So nigrostriatal pathway is going to be uh, maintained by your dopamine. So when the dopamine is going to reach your striatum, what happens is it is going to inhibit the nerves arising from your striatum. What is going to be the neurotransmitter, the nerve arising from your striatum? It is going to be acetylcholine. Can you just uh, imagine and tell me now what happens? Usually, substantia nigra and the striatum, you have a nerve fiber. The neurotransmitter over there is dopamine. From your striatum to your peripheral area, that is going to be supplied by your acetylcholine. Your acetylcholine is going to be the neurotransmitter. So, acetylcholine is going to be your neurotransmitter. Now, what happens is, in your Parkinson's disease, there is a decrease in the dopamine in your nigrostriatal pathway. 
when there is decrease in the dopamine in your nigrostriatal pathway what happens because of the death of the nerve fibers in the nigrostriatal pathway this dopamine which is going this dopaminergic nerve fibers that is going to supplying from your nigrostriatum your uh, substantia nigra to your striatum it is going to inhibit your acetylcholine generally now you don't have this dopamine in now what happens since there is a reduction in the dopamine that is going to be reaching your striatum what happens is there is no inhibition to your acetylcholine that is the reason why in parkinsonism there is going to be increased acetylcholine release so you have two important symptoms here number one is there is a decrease in the dopaminergic nerve fibers there is a decrease in the dopamine so that is one concern for us second concern is going to be there is a increase in the acetylcholine release therefore you are going to get extra pyramidal symptoms you know that acetylcholine leads to extra pyramidal symptoms so acetylcholine increase da irukadhu or problem so now what are the how you are going to approach this case of parkinson as a pharmacologist you are going to give two type of drug one you have to increase the dopamine other you are going to decrease the acetylcholine so what is the drug you are going to give for decreasing your acetylcholine anticholinergic but this anticholinergic has to pass your blood brain barrier isn't it to reach your substantia nigra and your striatum therefore you are going to give a central anticholinergic so the central anticholinergic drugs are given in case of your parkinsonism number one is over second thing you are going to have is increase the dopamine presence in the nigrostriatal pathway in order to increase the dopamine secretion what you can do one you have to give dopamine for the patient but unfortunately what happens is dopamine cannot be given as a oral drug so dopamine cannot give as a oral drug so what you will do is you go for a pro drug what is the pro drug for your dopamine levodopa levodopa is a pro drug that is given in the uh, by oral drug now you have given levodopa accepted but what happens is when you are going to give a levodopa for the patient when you are going to give a levodopa for the patient what happens is where they are going to be consumed by the peripheral areas they are going to be consumed by your peripheral areas so in order to make sure that they are not consumed by your peripheral areas what you are going to do what is the one that is going to consume in the peripheral areas your dopamine decarboxylase so when you are going to give a do levodopa for the patient this levodopa now it can cross your blood brain barrier it is getting absorbed but the problem here is it is now it is going to be absorbed it is going to be utilized by your peripheral uh, area so who is going to utilize that in the peripheral area by the, the conversion of l dopa to dopamine who is going to convert the l dopa levodopa to dopamine by the dopa decarboxylase so this dopamine decarboxylase enzyme in the peripheral area has to be inhibited am i right so this peripheral area la irukka kudiya dopamine decarboxylase has to be inhibited who is going to inhibit it is going to be inhibited by the carbidopa that is why we give levodopa carbidopa combination now you have overcome the blood brain barrier now you overcame the, the dopamine decarboxylase enzyme no problem now you have levodopa carbidopa this levodopa carbidopa can enter into your blood brain barrier okay now what happens this levodopa goes to your stri striatal pathway nigrostriatal pathway and now dopamine is going to be con the levodopa is going to get converted into dopamine this dopamine is going to coming down and it is going to go to your d2 receptors and now all the thing gets back to the normal now your nigrostriatal pathway gets back to the normal okay now there is another mechanism what happens is this dopamine can be inhibited this dopamine okay can be inhibited or they can be metabolized okay so in the peripheral area la in the levodopa can be metabolized into orthomethyl levodopa okay orthomethyl dopa who is going to do that comt so comt is the one that is going to inhibit comt is the one that is going to inhibit your that is going to convert your levodopa into orthomethyl dopa so appa nam enna pannu we have to inhibit this comt2 so one we have to inhibit this decarboxylase so adukku we have utilized carbidopa that is done now we have to do have a mechanism that is going to inhibit your comt which is going to inhibit your comt we have two type of drug number 1 nt capon and we have second one tol capon so nt capon tol capon these are the two drugs that are going to inhibit your comt now another problem we are facing first problem we have we have in the problem of crossing your blood brain barrier we have overcome using levodopa second problem we had uh, we had your dopamine decarboxylase enzyme that is overcome by adding carbidopa third problem we had is going to be uh, your comt 
Fasivo MT inhibition, we gave NT capone and toll capone. The fourth problem which we have here is okay, your dopamine can be metabolized inside your central nervous system. So, what we have to do, we have to inhibit this to metabolization of your dopamine in order to have a longer duration of action. What is the drug which we are going to give in order to prevent this metabolization? MAOB inhibitor. We are going to give MAOB inhibitor. Clear, right? So, we have to give MAOB inhibitor. Can you tell me what is the cheese reaction which we learnt in the morning? Which we learnt in the morning something called as cheese reaction. I think Revati was there in the morning. Can you tell me in cheese reaction which monoamine oxidase is going to be a problem? MAO which is going to get a problem in cheese reaction. Okay, which is going to be involved in the cheese reaction. Is it MOA, MA monoamine oxidase A or is it monoamine oxidase B? Can you tell me? Is it monoamine oxidase B or monoamine oxidase A? It is monoamine oxidase B. Remember, it is monoamine oxidase B which is involved in the cheese reaction. So here you are going to have your monoamine oxidase B. So this can also involve in the cheese reaction. Okay, so we are going to inhibit the MAOB. We will discuss about that anyway. And then you are going to have finally, there are certain drugs that can inhibit the NMDA receptors. So why we are decreasing, we are going to inhibit the NMDA receptor in order to increase the glutamate release, in order to increase the glutamate release. So let me, let's discuss about all these drugs. In, uh, we will discuss about this in a short while. And we are going to have, finally, we have central anticholinergic as I told you. So that is going to inhibit the acetylcholine release. What are the drugs? Benzotropin, Benzexol, Biperidin. So that is going to in, uh, be an important drug of choice in drug-induced Parkinsonism. Can you tell me which drug in induces Parkinsonism. Can someone respond in the chat which drug is going to induce Parkinsonism? Which drug is going to induce Parkinsonism? Drug induced Parkinsonism which is going to induce all your antipsychotic drugs like your alloperidol, flufenazine and bi uh, pimozidine and you're going to have chlorpromazine, you're going to have your theoridazine. All these drugs are basically going to cause a, all these drugs are going to be basically cause a first generation antipsychotic. They are going to cause a, a drug induced Parkinsonism. Okay, what are the benefit of using this central anticholinergic? They are going to be to preventing your tremor followed by your rigidity followed by your bradi uh, okay bradykinesia all these are going to be inhibited all of this going to be overcome by the utilization of your central anticholinergic hope you will remember now let's go with your levodopa so remember first drug of choice is going to be your levodopa in case of parkinsonism if you see any patient the first drug which you are going to give is your levodopa in levodopa always given with peripheral uh, ddc that is going to be your dopamine decarboxylase what are the peripheral dopamine decarboxylase enzyme inhibitor that is going to be a carbidopa and your benzeride okay you're going to have carbidopa and benzeride so how you're going to start with okay so you're going to start how you're going to start with the treatment so the patient comes to you first you're going to see the patient if they want to have typical symptom first start with a low dose of levodopa okay along with carbidopa you're going to start what are the side effects of use case of your levodopa? Initially, when you're going to start with your levodopa, carbidopa, what happens is they are going to give the nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, and hypotension. So the patient will be experiencing nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, and hypotension. But on the long-term utilization of this L-dopa, what happens? It leads to dyskinesia. Can you tell me why there is a dyskinesia? Can you tell me what is the reason why you have dyskinesia? Any idea? Why you have dyskinesia? Why do you have dyskinesia? Any idea? Why do you have dyskinesia? Any idea? Amantadin. Okay, so you are going to have what problem is? There is going to be a NMDA excessive activation. You have two important receptors. Okay, you have an important receptor called as NMDA AMPA. We will discuss all these things in detail in a short period of time. You have a NMDA receptors. You have a AMPA receptors. All these receptors are also going to get uh, excited because of excitation of yeah, dopamine receptor by L-dopa. Because of that, in the long run, you are going to have a dyskinesia. So what you have to do? You have to inhibit the NMDA receptor. How are you going to inhibit the NMDA receptor? By giving amantadine. So you are going to have amantadine. This amantadine is going to be a NMDA inhibitor. NMDA inhibitor. And what is left triacetam? Anyone? What is your left triacetam? What is the group of drug left triacetam? Where, we, where you have used a left triacetam? 
left triacetam. Remember, so you will be using this in case of seizures. It's an anti-epileptic drug. Left triacetam is an anti-epileptic drug. So it is also, it is going to be used here uh, to prevent the dyskinesia. You're going to use that to prevent the dyskinesia. Clear? So it is an anti-convulsant. Now coming to the L-dopa induced psychosis. So psychosis and your, uh, psychosis and your uh, Parkinson's are opposite. When you're going to treat a psychosis, it causes Parkinsonism. When you're going to treat a Parkinsonism, it is going to lead to psychosis. So all three are going to be, all these two are are going to be a opposite interlinked to each other in a reciprocal manner. So when you're going to give L-dopa, that is going to increase the psychosis. So treatment of choice is going to be, you're going to give a atypical antipsychotics like your Pima van Seren. You're going to give Pima van Seren, atypical antipsychotic. It's a drug of choice in case of a Parkinson induced, uh, drug induced psychosis. Okay. Now what happens? Wearing off effect. So, this will be in decreasing the benefit of L-dopa. So, on the long run, this is going to cause a wearing off effect that will decrease the benefit of L-dopa. And you're going to have on and off effect. What is on and off effect? I, if at all you get a chance to see a Parkinson patient. So, you can see that when the patient, we will be like uh, giving initially, we'll be starting a PD dose. So, morning one tablet, evening one tablet, liver dopa, you're going to ask the patient to take. But what happens, once they're going to take, they will be very active. There will be a decrease in all their symptoms. But often slowly what happens is, the symptoms will be raising. So, what you will do is, you will add a L-dopa with carbidopa, then also no use. Then you're going to have a COMT inhibitor, no use. Then after some time, you will be having a NAO inhibitor, no use. At the end of the day, at the maximum, when there is going to be all these drugs utilized, then also there is on and off effect. What you will do is, you will divide the dose into several. Okay, you will be giving every one hour, you will be asking the patient to consume to consume a, a dosage of dopamine, okay, liver dopa, so that the patient can remain active throughout the day. So, do you remember, we have discussed about two important things, concentration-dependent drugs, time-dependent drugs. Now, these are the time-dependent drugs, okay, these are the time-dependent drugs which you are going to remember. Next. Coming towards your drug interaction. Remember vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 increases the peripheral conversion of liver dopa into dopamine. Therefore, you, are, you should not give vitamin B6 along with your dopa, liver dopa, which can cause failure of your liver dopa therapy. Number one. Number two, remember domperidone versus metaclopramide. So, domperidone, metaclopramide. What are the difference? You know that we already discussed metaclopramide is a D2 receptor inhibitor. So, we have your D2 receptor inhibitor. Okay, they, sorry, it's going to be a D2 receptor agonist. D2 agonist. Your metaclopramide is a D2 agonist. So, what happens? D2 agonist, it can cross your blood-brain barrier and it is going to go to the CTZ. So, in the CTZ area, what happens? This is going to go and block your uh, CTZ area. It is going to go and block your CTZ area. This causes vomiting. Okay. D2 blockers, metaclopramide causes vomiting. Okay. So, it is going to block also, it is going to block your L-dopa. It is also going to block your L-dopa. Okay. So, it's going to block your L-dopa induced nausea and vomiting. And it is going to be having a L-dopa benefit. But what happens when you're going to give domperidone? Domperidone cannot cross your blood-brain barrier. Since it is not going to cross your blood-brain barrier, it is only causing the inhibition in your CTZ. Remember, this is your blood-brain barrier. This is going to be your blood-brain barrier. There is no coverage of blood-brain barrier on your CT cell. Now, what I am telling is you have two types of drugs. One is domperidone and other is going to be a metaclopramide. When you are going to give domperidone, that cannot cross your blood-brain barrier. So, they are going to only block the L-dopa vomiting. Okay. It is going to only block the L-dopa. Okay. For induced vomiting. L-dopa induced vomiting is alone going to be blocked. But what happens when you are going to give a uh, metaclopramide? Metaclopramide, they are going to be crossing the blood-brain barrier. So, since they are crossing the blood-brain barrier, what is the problem is, they will be blocking your CTZ induced nausea vomiting. That is not a problem. But what happens, they will also block your nigrostriatal pathway D2 receptors. They will also block the nigrostriatal pathway D2 receptor and they will be blocking your L-dopa 
benefit also. So L dopa is giving a benefit in the nigrostriatal pathway. But what happens when you're going to give a drug that is going to block the L dopa dopamine receptor that is present in the nigrostriatal pathway that is going to block both the vomiting as well as L dopa benefit. So you will be giving domperidone in the case of your Parkinsonism and you should avoid metaclopramide. You should avoid metaclopramide. You will be giving only domperidone. Hope you can understand. Now coming to the DA agonist. So, dopamine is directed to the other drug that is going to cause stimulation of your dopamine. So, you don't need conversion to your dopamine at all. So, L-dopana, you have to convert into dopamine by the uh, carbidopa addition, etc. But this does not have that problem. Second thing, less dyskinesia will be there and there's a longer duration of action. Now, coming to what are the two types of your dopamine agonists? Ergot derivative, non-ergot derivative. Ergon derivative number one, bromocryptin. Bromocryptin is going to be a drug which is going to excite your D2 receptors. So can you remember, I told you, right, whenever there is an increase in the dopamine, they are going to decrease your prolactin. So whenever there is a decrease in the prolactin, that is going to be used as a drug of choice in hyperprolactinemia. So bromocryptin is a drug utilized in the hyperprolactinemia, number one. Number two, you have something called as pergolid. Pergolid is going to be causing a vascular fibrosis. And what is the side effect here? I told you any D2 agonist is going to stimulate your CTZ receptors. And they are going to cause nausea, vomiting. And they can also cause digital gangrene. That is going to be due to ergotism. So that is called as St. Anthony's fire. This is called as St. Anthony's fire. Why this is? So I will tell you a short story. So what happened in a, you, in a western country, there was one church named, so church was named as St. Anthony's Church. So Angavandi, you had a very big hospital. So on the hospital lab, when the patient was given with ergot, many people had this gas, 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 gas digital gangrenes. So that is why they named it. So entire hospital, many people had this and it has turned into a fire of uh, patients of this uh, digital gangrene. That is why we call this ergotism as a St. Anthony's fire. We call it a St. Anthony's fire and that can lead to fibrosis of your pulmonary and retroperitoneal area. When there is a fibrosis in your retroperitoneal area, that leads to urinary retention and difficulty in urination. Therefore, ergot derivatives are not very popular. Now, we are going to go to the non-ergot derivative. Non-ergot derivative, they are very, very having less side effects and very popular. Number one, roperinol, okay, ropinirol, and you are going to have pram pramipraxol, and you are going to have your rotigatin. Okay, this ropinirol and your uh, pramipaxol, they are going to be acting as a sedator and they will also be a D3 agonist and they are going to act as an antioxidant. Whereas your rotigatin is a transdermal patch. It is going to be acting as a transdermal patch. Avaro. So what is the use? They are used in the mild Parkinsonism and the restless leg syndrome. The new drug, which is drug of choice for restless leg syndrome. Initially, the drug of choice for restless leg syndrome is a non-ergot derivative. But now what happens? It is not a drug of choice. Your gabapentin is a drug of choice because gabapentin has an increased safety margin. Because gabapentin is having an increased safety margin. Moving on to talk about the MAOB inhibitor. I told you, right? MAOB inhibitor. What does it done? MAOB inhibitor is going to be your selegilin, rosagilin, and safinamide. Selegilin, rosagilin, and safinamide. Okay, remember, MAOB inhibitor is not going to be the one that causes cheese reaction. That's why I was asking you, I think nobody was responding in the chat box. It is only your MAOA inhibitor that is going to cause cheese reaction. I have discussed about this already in the first session. Okay, MAOA inhibitor is the one that causes cheese reaction. We discussed in migraine, right? Do you remember in migraine I was discussing MAOA inhibitor is the one that leads to cheese reaction and is not MAOB. So MAOB is the one that is present in the dopamine uh, breakdown in your central nervous system. So selegilin, rosagilin, safinamide. These are the three important drugs which is used as a MAOB inhibitor. Which, these are the three drugs which is used as a MAOB inhibitor which I want you all to remember. And coming towards your free radical, they are going to increase the dopamine level and they are going to decrease the free radical level. Therefore, this is called as neuroprotective drug. So the selegilin, rosagilin, safinamide is called as neuroprotective drug. 
they are going to be an important side effect that is going to be a insomnia. So what is going to be a MAOB inhibitor? MAOB is nothing but a free radical. So you are going to use MAOB inhibitor as a free radical destroyer or neuroprotective in reaction. With this, we are completing the next group of drugs that is going to be a Parkinsonism. Now we are going to move towards the antidepressant drugs. So what is antidepressant drugs? Antidepressants, they are typical antidepressants and atypical antidepressants. Two types are there. Typical antidepressant, they are going to increase the amine in your central nervous system. That is going to be acting on 5-HT or NA receptor. So you have something called as 5-HT serotonin, you have NA noradrenaline. This is when there is going to be action that is increase in amine. That is going to be your typical antidepressant. Atypical antidepressant, they are the new me mechanism of action of antidepressant. I will tell you in detail. So typical, they are going to increase the amine in your central nervous system. How do they increase the amine level? Two, level, two points are there. One, what happens is, oh, from where you are going to get this 5-hydroxytryptamine or your uh, norepinephrine. So all this is going to be obtained from your protein ty amino acid tyrosine. They are going to get converted into a 5-hydroxytyrosine. They are going to convert, get into a dopamine. They are going to get converted into a noradrenaline. Everything comes from your tyrosine. So what happens when this is going to be released into the synapse? 5-HT arcotol and noradrenal arcotol. They can get reuptaked. So what happens? They can be reuptaked by your NET. What is NET? Norepinephrine transporter and you have your SERT serotonin transporter. So if you are going to inhibit these two uh, transporters, what happens? There will be more amount of norepinephrine, more amount of your uh, serotonin present in the synapse which will prolong the duration of action. So when there is a prolongation of duration of action, they are going to cause a central nervous system stimulant so it will prevent the central nervous system depression that is going to be your antidepressant or the main action clear right so your typical antipsychotics or antidepressants are going to increase the levels of 5-HT and noradrenaline in the synapse. What are the two mechanisms? Reuptake inhibitors. And what is the second mechanism it is going to use? So the breakdown of your serotonin. So the breakdown of your 5-HT, okay, in the peripheral areas is going to be done by MAOA inhibitor. Just now I told you MAOB is going to be in the central nervous system. Whereas your MAOA is present in the peripheral nervous system, that is going to break down your serotonin, and break down your noradrenaline, it is going to be playing a very important role that is called as your monoamine oxidase A. Now remember, the whenever there is going to be a monoamine oxidase A involvement, that leads to cheese reaction. That leads to cheese reaction, you all know that. Isn't it? Any doubt in this? Yes. Now coming to the non-selective and irreversible blocker. What is this non-selective irreversible blocker? So antidepressants, first uh, generation antidepressants are non-selective and irreversible. What it is going to block? It is going to block both your NET, norepinephrine transporter and your serotonin transporter. It is going to block, block both your norepinephrine transporter and serotonin block transporter. Action is going to be two weeks even after stopping the drug you will be having. Okay, so what are the drugs? Trinyl, uh, you're going to have your trinyl, ciproamine and phenylzin. So you have two drugs, trinyl, ciproamine and you have your phenylzin. These are the two uh, first generation antidepressant drugs. So they have a maximum cheese reaction. Then we have the second drug, which is going to be reversible inhibitors of MAO. So MAO, so MOA, monoamine oxidase A. So that is going to be a miglobimide. So miglobimide, drug of choice in atypical depression. Miglobimide, the drug of choice in atypical uh, depression. This is going to, what it is going to do? It is going to inhibit your MAO A, inhib MAO A receptor. It is going to inhibit your MAO A receptor. Clear, right? So we have seen two important things. Number one is going to be non-selective irreversible. Number two is going to be your reversible inhibitors of your MAOA. Now coming to the third one, inhibitor of MAOB. So when you are going to inhibit this MAOB, MAOB is present in the central nervous system. When it is going to inhibit this MAOB, there is an increased availability of the drug. Do you remember what are the MAOB? It is going to be a selegilin, rasagilin, safinamide. So remember, apart from their action as a, apart from their action as a dopamine agonist, 
apart their action as a atypical parkinsonism drug apart from acting as a atypical parkinsonism drug they are also going to have action as they are also going to have action on depression so but you have to remember two things if it is going to be a oral drug it is going to act against parkinsons if we are going to give us a transdermal pouch transdermal uh, patch you are going to utilize as a depression so anti depressant act ago when you are going to give it as a transdermal patch when you are going to give it as a oral drug it is going to act as against the parkinsons against the parkinsons now coming to the tricyclic antidepressants so tricyclic antidepressant as the word tells three cycles it is going to inhibit three cycle three cycle what are the three cycles one it is going to inhibit your net number thing it is going to inhibit your sert and the third one it is going to inhibit your d2 so this is going to be your tricyclic antidepressant they are the irreversible they are the sorry, reversible inhibition of your noradrenaline na na as well as your 5ht receptor norepinephrine or noradrenaline as well as your 5ht receptor onset of action is very slow what are the group of drugs imipramine amitriptyline clomipramine desipramine nortriptyline amoxipine so nortriptyline and amoxipine can you tell me one important uh, your amitriptyline where else you use amitriptyline can you tell me in which other condition we discussed it till now we used amitriptyline it is a tricyclic antidepressant you know that and you used that can you tell me in which condition you used it can you tell me in which condition you used amitriptyline i gave you i do i have discussed you discussed this with you amitriptyline is used in which other condition okay amitriptyline you are going to use in which other condition can you recall and tell me can you recall and tell me in which condition you used amitriptyline in which condition you used amitriptyline anyone anyone amitriptyline is used okay i'll give you time till the end of the session just recall and tell me where else you saw amitriptyline as a drug of choice amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant where else you used amitriptyline as a drug of choice you are going to tell me okay i'll discuss so you're going to have your amitriptyline imipramine clomipramine desipramine you're going to have your nortriptyline and amoxapine so amoxapine uh, amoxapine is a drug which is going to have in addition of your norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor okay it is also going to have a problem in your d2 receptor so it is going to also cause d2 agonist can you tell me what happens when you're going to give d2 inhibition it is going to cause extra pyramidal symptom number one it is also going going to cause increase in the prolactin so what are the side effects of your d2 inhibitors that is going to cause extra pyramidal symptoms and hyperprolactinemia whenever you are going to tell talk about your uh, d2 receptor inhibitors you have to always talk about the extra pyramidal symptoms and hyperprolactins clear right then you are going to have clomipramine and desipramine so what are the four drugs you have to remember imipramine you have to remember amitriptyline you are going to remember clomipramine you are going to remember desipramine clear right imipramine amitriptyline clomipramine desipramine imipramine amitriptyline clomipramine desipramine clear right then you are going to have nortriptyline as well as your amoxapine now what are the side effects so anticholinergics they are going to be maximum in case of amitriptyline so anticholinergic action maximum occurs in amitriptyline maximum occurs in amitriptyline so they can cause dryness of mouth they can cause urine retention midriasis there is going to be a midriasis increase in the iop level and they are also going to block your alpha 1 so remember any uh, first generation or your anti tricyclic antidepressant apart from having action in your apart from having action in your net and your 5-hydroxytomine uh, that is going to be your sert they are also going to have action on your alpha 1 receptor okay it is also going to have a, a histamine receptor when it is going to block alpha 1 receptor you know alpha 1 is going to be important in vasoconstriction whenever there is going to be alpha 1 staying alone and do you remember vasomotor effect of dale in vasomotor effect of dale what he told this alpha 1 is going to alpha 1 is going to cause vasoconstriction whereas the beta 2 is going to cause vasodilation 
beta 2 is going to cause vasodilation when you are going to block the alpha 1 what happens there is going to be a decrease in the blood pressure because of your beta 2 acting individually that can lead to hypotension is it clear so that is your hypotension next your h1 inhibitor h1 inhibitor going to cause sedation weight gain h1 inhibition causes sedation it is going to cause weight gain and it has a low safety margin a very important point is it is going to have a very low safety margin okay it is very fatal because of overdose when there is a overdose what happens it leads to metabolic acidosis so what is the treatment of choice when there is a metabolic acidosis NaHCO3 is the treatment of choice sodium bicarbonate is the treatment of choice then you have arrhythmias whenever there is arrhythmia what is your treatment of choice lignocaine is a treatment of choice whenever you are going to have arrhythmia what is going to be a treatment of choice lignocaine is a treatment of choice whenever you are going to have seizure what is the treatment of choice diazepam is a treatment of choice whenever you are going to have seizure what is your treatment of choice diazepam is going to be a treatment of choice now I IV lipid emulsion is going to be causing a severe toxicity. Remember, IV lipid emulsion it is going to have a severe toxicity. So you can there is not it is not used in atropine hemodialysis. Why? Because this has an increased tissue distribution. Remember, your amitriptyline, your imipramine, your clomipramine, desipramine, all have a increased tissue distribution. Because of this, what happens? There is no use of performing a hemodialysis. Now the question arises in what all drug in what all drug you have to avoid hemodialysis avoid hemodialysis okay i'll write i'll write it down i'll be telling you now write it down guys just hold on where shall i write it okay i'll just add a page here and i will write it down just copy this a very important thing you need to remember so what are the uh, drugs where you have to avoid you have to avoid hemodialysis just remember a v o i d just remember like this avoid a stands for amitriptyline so a stands for amitriptyline you are going to avoid hemodialysis in the patient with who is going to consume amitriptyline toxicity whenever there is going to be a amitriptyline toxicity you are going to avoid whenever you are going to have an amphetamine amphetamine okay amitriptyline toxicity amitriptyline Tylin toxicity and V stands for Virapamil. Virapamil also add along with Virapamil Diltiazem. Diltiazem. Okay, you're going to add Diltiazem. That is going to also cause, that is also going to be having a IVD tissue distribution because of this. There is no use of performing hemodialysis. No use in performing hemodialysis. Okay. What is the O stands for? Opioid. O stands for opioid. I stands for imipramine. Imipramine is also going to be a tricyclic antidepressant. And D stands for digoxin. D stands for diazepam. Diazepam. Clear? So these are the drugs where you will not consume. Okay. You will not going to do a, a hemodialysis. The patient who is going to have toxicity in these drugs, you will not perform hemodialysis. Is it clear? You will not perform hemodialysis. Now moving on to discuss about the uses of your uh, tricyclic antidepressant. The uses of tricyclic antidepressant are number one, they are going to have a migraine profile axis. They are going to have a migraine profile axis. There is going to be a neuropathic pain. So migraine profile axis number one, neuropathic pain, this is going to be useful and this is used as a second line of depression. You will think that tricyclic antidepressants the first line of treatment. Never. First line of treatment is going to be your SSRI. You are going to perform SSRI you are going to give. It is not going to be a tricyclic antidepressant because they have a wider range of action, wider range of action in terms of their mechanism. So you are not going to give, you are going to give only the second line. Why? Because they have a less safety margin, they have a slow onset. Less safety margin and they are going to have a slow onset. Now moving to talk about the SSRI, selectone serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Here your net receptor is untouched. Only your SERT receptor is going to be acted. So what happens here? Only your SERT is going to be acted. So only your serotonin is going to be reuptaked. There is no reuptake of your norepinephrine. So the most common... Uh, 
okay only you are going to block your serotonin receptors okay we have take receptors you are not going to block your noradrenaline because of that what happens your synapse is going to have more amount of serotonin what are the symptoms you are going to get most common symptom is going to be your git side effect you are going to have your nausea vomiting diarrhea and sexual side effects will be there so that is going to be your decrease in the sexual interest there is going to be a delayed or absent orgasm so what is going to be a drug of choice is this so this is used as a drug of choice in premature ejaculation whenever the patient is going to have a premature ejaculation you can give the trace you can give the ssri selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor as a drug of choice because they are going to cause delay in orgasm okay ma what is a drug you are going to give Depoxitin. Depoxitin is the drug of choice in case of your uh, premature ejaculation. Number two. And what is a CNS? Okay. CNS is going to be, side effect is going to be insomnia and anxiety. Insomnia and anxiety. What is the drug you are going to give for anxiety? So your drugs which is going to give for anxiety is your fluoxetine. Okay. Side effects here. Number one, we are utilizing it as a drug. So side effect is going to be delayed or absent of orgasm. orgasm. So what you are going to give? You are going to give Give this drug diloxetin depoxetin as a drug of choice in case of premature ejaculation now coming to the central nervous system side effect you have insomnia and anxiety will be there so what is the drug of choice for anxiety fluoxetin is going to be the drug of choice for anxiety now you have serotonin syndrome what is serotonin syndrome now you have an increased serotonin for action in the body when there's an increased serotonin that leads to hyperthermia that leads to diarrhea that leads to myoclonus remember three important things that is going to lead to hyperthermia that is going to lead to diarrhea that is going to lead to myoclonus okay wow. why because because of the combination of your serotonergic drugs okay along with when you're going to give this uh, this uh, your uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor you are going to give along with some uh, tri your triptans you have suma triptans and everyone again they are also going to cause increased serotonin receptors so when you are going to combine these two drugs they will lead to serotonin syndrome which is going to cause hyperthermia diarrhea and myoclonus now coming to the next drug that is going to be a paroxetine paroxetine is going to have a maximum sexual side effects and they are also going to be a teratogen okay they will be causing cardiac valve dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension in a fetus so you are not going to give this paroxetin for a uh, pregnant individual and discontinuous syndrome or withdrawal syndrome when you are going to withdraw the selective serotonin and reuptake inhibitor they are going to have headache anxiety and insomnia will be present in these patients now coming back to talk about what are the two types maximum minimum okay maximum is going to be in the short acting drug like your venlafaxine and your paroxetine they have a short acting drug so they are going to have a maximum side effects withdrawal side effect minimum side effects will be there in long acting like your fluoxetine fluoxetine will have a long term they are going to have a long action so they are going to have a minimal side effect now coming to the uses okay what are going to be the uses number one in depression so drug of choice in depression ssri okay ssri la drug of choice okay ssri is a drug of choice for depression they have a better safety margin citalopram and sertalin so it's a best one so what are the best drug you're going to give in the antipsychotic so antidepressant it's going to be a citalopram and your sertalin it's going to be a citalopram and your sertalin which are going to be the best drug you're going to give in the as a antidepressant these are the best drug which you're going to give as a antidepressant so okay what are the drugs citalopram and your sertalin citalopram and your sertalin is it clear guys do you have any doubt in this okay this is your antidepressant now moving to talk about the anxiety disorder so in a performance anxiety when the patient has a performance anxiety for example you are going to go for a tomorrow you are going to have an exam tonight you have a anxiety what is the drug best drug it is going to be not your antidepressants don't take antidepressants they will be depressing your central nervous system in turn what happens is you will forget whatever you learned so what you will do is you will give beta blockers for those patients beta blockers are going to help in performance anxiety beta blockers will help you in performance anxiety and what is going to be the third one that is going to be your third one that is going to be your uh, third one that is going to be your uh, generalized anxiety disorder if the patient is going to have a generalized anxiety disorder okay one minute in a generalized anxiety disorder what will you be your uh, drug of choice you are going to go for ssri number one you are going to go for ssri ssri is considered as a drug of choice in case of your generalized anxiety disorder number two is your 
tricyclic antidepressant. Okay, then you can give benzodiazepine. These are generalized anxiety disorders. So, Appa, on the exam, you are not going to have a generalized anxiety disorder. You are going to have performance anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder, the drug of choice you are going to follow is going to be your SSRI, TCA, benzodiazepine, BZD, and buspiron. Can you recall and tell me what is buspiron? Where we read buspiron? Pradap Kumar, can you recall and tell me where we read buspiron? Do you remember? In the beginning of discussion, we are talking about some serotonin receptor, 5-HT1A. This 5-HT1A receptor is going to be a buspiron. In there itself, I told you, buspiron is going to use as anti-anxiety drug. Now, can you recollect and bring it back? Yes. Now, coming to the next one, that is going to be a panic attack. In panic attack, what is the drug of choice? Benzodiazepam is going to act as a drug of choice. Then you have bulimia. Bulimia, what is drug of choice? Fluoroxetine. Fluoxin is going to be a drug of choice in case of bulimia and in obsessive compulsive disorder. I am not going into the entire uh, uh, psychiatric disorders. Obsessive compulsive disorder, what is going to be a uh, treatment of choice? It is going to be again your know, SSRI fluoxetine. If fluoxetine is resistant, then you go for clomipramide. So then you go for clomipramide. Then you have your phobias, PTSD. In all these conditions, you go for SSRI drugs. You're going to go for SSRI. Okay. Then now we have completed selective serotonin receptor inhibitor, reuptake inhibitor. Now we are going to go to the next one. That is serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. consider See, what happened in your tricyclic antidepressant? They are also acting in the alpha block, alpha receptor. They are also acting on the H1 receptor. Okay, here what happens? We are going to prevent that action in the alpha receptors and your H1 receptors. We are going to prevent that by giving selective serotonin and norepinephrine, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. That is only your SERT and your net is going to be affecting. They lack the autonomic side effects of your TCA. We had lots of autonomic side effects like your cholinergic side effects. So that is prevented here. So what are the drugs here you are going to have? Venlafaxin, you have a duloxetine, you have milna cap cipron, milna cipron. So, what are going to be your deloxetine? Deloxetine is a hepatotoxic in nature. Venlafaxin it has a maximum discontinuization effect, and we have this milna cipron. So, what are the usage? You are going to use this in a severe depression. Okay, in your fibromyalgia, in your fibromyalgia, like your body ache. Fatigue, the patient comes to you and tells, but there is no lab abnormalities, then you are going to give deloxetine. Okay, the patient is coming to you, she is telling that you would have noticed this old age uh, grandfathers, grandmothers, they will be coming to you with complaint of kai kal kodachal. They will be telling that their uh, head, their hand is paining, leg is paining, knee is paining. But if you are going to see there is no abnormality in them, then you can give duloxetine in this patient. Duloxetine will have a good effect in them. Then you are going to have your stress incontinence. Whenever a patient is going to have urination on cough and lock, then you are going to give duloxetine. You are going to give duloxetine. Can you give me what is the drug of choice in your uh, urge incontinence? So urge incontinence, what is drug of choice? Do you all know? You have your me, me ban. So you have something called as, what is the drug? Do you all know? Okay, do you all know? So the drug which is going to be from your, uh, from your uh, sympathetic nervous system. From your sympathetic nervous system, anyone? From your sympathetic nervous system, you are going to have a drug. Can anyone recall and tell me what is the drug? Mega, bra, mega, mega, someone, something. Very good, very good. You are just coming. You are, it's coming to your mind. But can you recall and tell me very quickly? So what it is going to do? Basically, basically what it is going to do? It's an anti-adrenergic group of drugs. Whether it is anti-adrenergic group of drugs, are you sure with that? Are you sure with that? Is that anti-adrenergic group of drugs? Come on guys, you can recall and tell me. It's everything, everything you know. Basically, you know everything. You are just going to recall and tell me the drug name. You are going to just recall and tell me the drug name. What is that drug name? What is that drug name? I am waiting for you. I'm, I will wait for you. Just try to answer. So you have something called as beta 3. You have something called as beta 3. Okay. This is going to be the drug which is given. In case of urge incontinence, I am just meaning that also in urge incontinence, what is the drug you are going to give? Just try to recall. 
in urge incontinence in urge incontinence what is going to be the drug you are going to give the drug you are going to give in urge incontinence mira be gron remember it is a mira mira be gron mira be gron it is going to be your drug which is going to be given mira be gron is a drug which is going to be given okay for urge incontinence mira be gron is going to be the drug which is going to be given in the urge incontinence what they are going to do they are going to be causing beta 3 agonist they are going to be your beta 3 agonist when i am discussing about your uh, anticholinergic cholinergic adrenergic anti adrenergic i'll tell this be beta 3 so in beta 3 you are going to have something called as mirabigron this mirabigron is going to be used in urge incontinence for stress incontinence you are going to use duloxetin so just see what are the symptoms they are going to give you with the symptom you decide Now coming to the neuropathic pain, it is going to be SNRI or TCA, SNRI or tricyclic antidepressant, SNRI or tricyclic antidepressant. Now whatever we discussed are the typical, are the typical antidepressants. What are the typical antidepressants till now we discussed? One is a tricyclic antidepressant, number one. Number two, we add is going to be your serato selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Then we add selective serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Now we have the fourth type that is going to be a typical group. Okay, a typical group. Just draw a tableau column. Drugs. First column is going to be drugs. Then you are going to talk about your serotonin reuptake. Then you are going to talk about your five H T two A inhibition. The C R T. Then five H T two A inhibition. okay so serotonin and 5ht2a inhibition see here first one serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitor it is going to be serotonin antagonist 5ht2a y inhibit panadhu that's why we call it as serotonin antagonist and it is also going to prevent reuptake inhibitor that is going to be a 5ht2a inhibition and serotonin inhibition they are going to be called as trazodone so the drug or drug here you are going to see is trazodone they are the atypical antidepressants trazodone what is trazodone they are going to inhibit your 5ht2a as well as your srt okay so this is going to cause increase in the redness radi okay it is going to cause decrease in increase in the redness it is going to cause increase in the sedation it is going to cause priapism why there is a priapism priapism is going to be your painful erection isn't it you are going to have a painful erection why do you have a painful erection because there is going to be increase in there is going to be a inhibition of 5ht2a because of inhibition of 5ht2a what happens there is going to be a vasodilatation you know that serotonin receptor causes vasoconstriction this is going to cause vasodilatation your penile uh, vessels are going to be vasodilated so there is more blood vessel that is going to be present inside that is going to be causing priapism hope you will be understanding that now we are going to move towards the next one that is going to be your yes P A R I. What is this S P A R I? It is going to be again re uh, serotonin. It is going to be again re uptake inhibitor, but along with uh, along with your serotonin. So it is going to be a partial antagon, partial agonist. Instead of antagonizing, instead of serotonin antagonizing, they are going to be serotonin, serotonin partial, partial agonist, partial agonist at. Okay, five H T one A. It is going to be a partial agonist of five H T one A. Can you recall and tell me five H T one A partial agonism will help us in anti anxiolytic or it is going to be anti anxiety or it is going to be a anxiolytic. So you are going to give this drug vil vilazodone. Vilazodone will be helping not only in anti depressant activity but it will also help in anti anxiety activity. third is going to be a nassa okay noradrenaline specific serotonogenic agent noradrenaline specific serotonogenic agent so you are going to have your mirtazapine so what are the third drug you are going to see in atypical first one is a trazodone second thing we saw is going to be your vilda second thing we saw is going to be your vilazodone then third one we are going to see is your mirzad mirtazapine so the third drug we are seeing is mirtazapine mirtazapine it is going to be normal in your srt it is not going to cause srt inhibition but it is going to inhibit your 5 ht 
2A. Pi HT2A receptor is going to be inhibited by your mirtazapine. And additional to it, it is also inhibiting alpha 2. It is going to inhibit your alpha 2. Okay, it is going to inhibit your alpha 2. And it is also going to increase the release of 5HT. They are going to increase the release of serotonin. So your alpha 2 inhibition will be causing increase in the release of uh, noradrenaline and 5-HT release. Okay. So because of this, what happens? The patient is going to have a both antidepressant action, but it is going to cause a weight gain sedation, but no sexual side effect. Why there is no sexual side effect? Because there is no involvement of your there is no involvement of your SERT inhibition. SERT inhibition illa anala, sexual side effect illa. So what are the drugs where you have minimal sexual side effect? You have your mirtazipine, you are going to have your Vilda, Vilazidin, Vilazidone and your Bapropion. You have Bapropion. So what is this? Bupropion, not Bapropion, sorry, Bupropion. So what is Bupropion? Bupropion is going to be your noradrenaline and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. There is no action on your serotonin. So because of that, they can be used in depression, obesity and also it is used in smoking cessation. Okay, so what are the drugs that are going to be useful? Varinicillin. Okay, it is going to be Varinicillin. 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 It is going to be a partial agonist at nicotinic receptor and they are going to also help in neuropsychiatry. But the problem is they increase the suicidal idea. Therefore, we are not using it as a popular drug. Clear, right? Then you have your miscellaneous drug. Number one is going to be your tignaptin. What is tignaptin? It's a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. It's going to be a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. Then you are going to have your esketamine. Esketamine is going to be a nasal drug. It is a cause helpful in resistant depression. Then postpartum depression. Very important. Listen. In postpartum depression, you are going to have decrease in the GABA modulator. So example, you are going to have your Brexonolone. Okay, it's an IV infusion. Then you have your Zuranolone. Zuranolone is going to be given as a oral. So you are going to have your Brixanolone. Brixanolone. And you are going to have your Zuranolone. All this alone drugs. Alone drugs is going to be postpartum depression. So postpartum depression, what are the drugs you are going to give? Number one, Brixanolone. Number two, Zuranolone. Brixanolone, Zuranolone. So these are the two drugs which is given in the postpartum depression. First, then you are going to talk about your Buspiron. Buspiron, they are going to be anti-anxiety drug. They are going to act on the 5-HT1A receptor. They are going to act on 5-HT1A receptor. There is no sedation. There is no abuse problem. They are going to be a anxiolytic uh, drug. Next, we are going to move into the very important drug that is going to be a bipolar disorder. What is a bipolar disorder, guys? Very easy. Bipolar disorder are nothing but they are going to be in acute mania and you are going to have your depression. So, in only acute mania, you are going to just, what is the drug of choice? Atypical antipsychotics plus or minus lithium. Okay, when you have bipolar disorder, when you call it as bipolar disorder, followed by mania, when there is an episode of depression, then you call it as a bipolar disorder. What is the drug of choice in bipolar disorder? Fluoxetine, olanzapine and lithium lamotrigrine. What are the drug of choice? Fluoxetine, olanzapine, you are going to give lithium and lamotrigine. These are the important drug of choice in case of bipolar disorders. These are the important drug of choice in case of bipolar disorders. Is it clear? Then you are going to have SSRI. So SSRI, only antidepressant you can give in between that maniac switch. When there is a maniac switch, you can go for SSRI. If there is more than uh, four attacks per year, you call it as rapid cycle. What is the drug of choice you are going to have in case of rapid cycle? You are going to go for valproate. Valproate is a drug of choice in case of a rapid cycle. Is it clear? Next is going to be your mood stabilizers. What are the mood stabilizers? Number one, you have your lithium. Number two, you have your anti-epileptic drug. What are the anti-epileptic drug? Valproate, lamotrigine, you have your carbamazepine, benzodiazepines and your topiramide. Let's start with your lithium first. Okay, under the lithium, you are going to remember test tube weak. You are going to remember 
test tube week. So you are going to monitor. So remember, there are important side effects of your lithium. What you are going to monitor? Test tube weeks. So test, what are the tests you are going to do? For fine tremor. So T for tremor. So you are going to see fine tremor, which is going to be the most common side effects of your lithium. And TFT. So you are going to go for hypothyroidism. You are going to check. TFT, hypothyroidism. And your T U stands for UPT. So you are going to see whether the patient is pregnant because it's a teratogenic drug. It causes Epstein anomaly and what is blood so in the blood you are going to see leukocytosis whether the patient going to have increase in the WBC count and E stands for ECG tongue flat there is going to be a six, six sinus syndrome there can be a flat tongue flat syndrome ECG and six sinus syndrome can you repeat along with me M stands for monitor so what you are going to monitor test tube week T stands for tremor, fine tremor, which is the most common condition. F TFT, next is going to be TFT, hypothyroidism, UPT, teratogenic Epstein's anomaly. Then you have blood leukocytosis. There is an increase in the WBC count. Followed by your ECG, there is going to be flat tongue or six sinus syndrome. There is going to be a flat, flat tongue or there is going to be six sinus syndrome. There is going to be a flat tongue or there is going to be a six sinus syndrome. Flat tongue or there is going to be a six sinus syndrome. Is it clear guys? Is it clear? Flat tongue or there is going to be a six sinus syndrome. Hope it is clear for you all. Hope it is clear for you all. All you are clear with it? Do you have any doubt? Hope you don't have any doubt, right? Hope you don't have any doubt, right? Okay, UPT, teratogenic, blood disc, leukocytosis. There is an increased WBC count. Then your ECG. In ECG, what you are going to find? You are going to find a flat tongue or six sinus syndrome. Next is going to be test tube weak, W-E-E-K. What is W-E-E-K? W stands for weight gain. Okay, E stands for examination, edema. And another E stands for electrolyte, hypercalcemia. So there is going to be increase in the parathyroid hormone release. And K stands for your kidney function test k stands for your kidney function test k stands for your kidney function test okay so there is going to be a kidney function test nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors so that is going to cause polyuria remember lithium is going to be an important cause of nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors so other drug which is going to cause nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors is going to be amyloride what is going to be a drug of choice in nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors it is going to be thiazide thiazide is a drug of choice in nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors does. next you are going to have overdose so i have told you test tube weak okay so what is going to be a overdose problem they have a narrow safety margin they cause chorus tremor diarrhea ataxia confusion hyperreflexia what is the treatment of choice no antidote hemodialysis so you are going to go directly for hemodialysis remember never add thiazide diuretics Edikra patient don't add lithium because thiazide it is going to cause increase in the lithium reabsorption from the urine. So always remember normally thiazide diuretic toxicity, nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors, drug of choice is going to be thiazide. But remember, when you are going to have a lithium toxicity induced in nephrogenic diabetes inhibitors, never go for thiazide group, you are going to go for amyloride because thiazide is going to increase the toxicity of your lithium. Clear, right? Now, serum level. In the 1 to 1.5 milli equilor per liter, that is going to cause acute mania. When you are going to have your 0.5 to 1 milli equilor per liter, that is going to be helpful in the prophylaxis of BPD. So toxicity starts when it is going to be more than 1.5 milli equilor per liter and in the hemodialysis, okay, there is going to be more than 3.5 milli equilor per deciliter. In 3.5 unit per deciliter. Okay, wow. so you are going to have more than 3.5 milli equilor per deciliter, that is going to be your hemodialysis. Okay, sedative and hypnotics, treatment of choice, insomnia. Insomnia, this is going to be a treatment of choice. Remember, insomnia this is going to be a treatment of choice insomnia it is going to be a treatment of choice hope you all remember right hope you will remember so there is no doubt i hope so you will not have any doubt in this if you have any doubt kindly post me kindly post me if you have any doubt hope you don't have any doubt okay do you have any doubt till now any doubt you can post me in the chat box if you have any doubt till now if you have any doubt till now, you can post me in the chat box. If not, I'll be moving towards the next important problem. What I'm going to, I'm going to move towards the next important problem. Is it clear for everyone?
everyone right yes so sedative hypnotics is the treatment of choice is going to be your insomnia so sedative hypnotics the treatment of choices insomnia for insomnia you're going to utilize now coming to the GABA receptors very very important from here we are going to have just 10 more pages in your central nervous system i want you to have a maximum attention here so we are going to complete it in next uh, okay half an hour or what i will okay next half an hour or what I will do, I will uh, stop with this. Okay, let me stop with this point. So we will continue from the GABA receptors after a break. So we will take a break till 9 o'clock. So 9 p.m. Okay, 9 p.m. I want you all to come back at 9 p.m. We will start discussing about your uh, GABA receptor. We will go with barbiturates. We will go with your benzodiazepam. Then we will discuss about the alcohol. Barbiturate, benzodiazepam, alcohol and seizures. So then we will go for the endocrine disorder. After completing, we will go for the endocrine disorder. Is it clear? Thank you so much for joining. Let's uh, come back at 9 p.m. sharply. Good evening, all. Happy that you are back after the brief discussion in the central nervous system. And uh, now we are going to start with the discussion on uh, GABA receptors. We are left with your sedative and hypnotics as well as your benzodiazepines. And we are also left with your anti-epileptic or anti-convulsants. So let's discuss. Let's start discussing about those drugs. And once that is over, let's move into the endocrinology and hematology. Okay. So hope you are all uh, very brisk after your uh, dinner. So let's start discussing. The first one is going to be your GABA receptor. See, GABA receptor is very important to understand. So GABA receptor is one type of receptor which is going to be a chloride channel. Okay, it's nothing but what is GABA receptor? They are nothing but they are chloride channels basically guys. They are just chloride channels. So what happens is whenever your GABA, GABA molecule is going to come and bind at the GABA receptor, there is going to be opening of your chloride channel. Because of opening of chloride channel, what happens? There is a hyperpolarization. Whenever there is hyperpolarization, what is going to be the final outcome? It causes hyperpolarization, which leads to inhibition of your central nervous system. That is why we call GABA as inhibitory neurotransmitter. We have certain neurotransmitter which are inhibitory in nature and certain neurotransmitter which are uh, excitatory in nature. Like your glutamine, like your uh, dopamine, all are going to be an excitatory neurotransmitter. Whereas your inhibitory neurotransmitter it is going to be a GABA. Now, to understand this GABA receptor, I have just drawn in a cut section of your GABA receptor. Your GABA receptor is going to have five important subunits. It is going to have two alpha, two beta and one gamma. I will draw again for uh, better viewing. So, this is going to be your receptor. This receptor is going to have, okay, it is going to have a alpha, it is going to have beta, it is going to have alpha, then it is going to have gamma. So, this is how your entire B uh, GABA receptor is arranged. Now, this same receptor is not only accepting your GABA, but it is also accepting benzodiazepine. It is also accepting Z group of drugs. It is also accepting barbiturates. Remember, this GABA receptor is going to accept GABA. It is going to accept benzodiazepine. It is going to accept Z group of drugs. It is going to accept barbiturates. So what is the question that you need to ask yourself is, where is this drug acting in my receptor? I have five different units. So in which unit or in which place my drug is going to act? So the first one that is going to be your, uh, the first one that is going to be your GABA receptor, the GABA, GABA. So your GABA is going to bind with the GABA receptor at the junction of alpha and beta. It is going to bind at the junction of alpha and beta. I'll be using a brown color for this. So your brown color, this is where your GABA is going to attach. So GABA is going to attach at the junction of alpha and beta. Clear, right? Next, your benzodiazepam. I'll use black color for benzodiazepam. Remember, benzodiazepam is going to attach in the junction of alpha and gamma. Okay, this uh, GABA is going to attach at the junction of alpha and beta, whereas benzodiazepam is going to attach in the junction of alpha and gamma. 
that is this place so this is the place where your benzodiazepam where your z group of drugs z group of drugs is going to attach whereas these are the two places where your gaba is going to come and attach clear right then you have the last one barbiturate remember your barbiturate is going to attach in the allosteric side your barbiturate attaches in the allosteric side why this is important so you will think this while reading or we're not, it's not a very important thing. Why should I read like that? We will be thinking. But unfortunately, in the 2023 November INICET exam, uh, Central Institute exam for the postgraduate entrance exam. So there, this question was asked. Okay. The question was, where is going to be the binding site of benzodiazepam receptor? So they are just marked in the... Marked in the uh, marked in a diagram and they asked us to uh, select which is the site where your benzodiazepam comes and attaches. So that is why this is very important. Let's see the two drugs. We have barbiturates, we have benzodiazepam. So both are going to act in the GABA. Barbiturates are going to be a GABA mimetic. They are going to be sitting at the allosteric site of your barbiturate. It's going to come and sit at the allosteric site of your GABA. And they are going to mimic your, ga ga mimic your GABA. Whereas benzodiazepam comes and attaches at the alpha and gamma junction. It is going to be attaching at the alpha and gamma junction. And they are going to cause GABA facilitation. That means it increases the frequency of opening. Or it is going to increase the frequency of opening. Okay, now you have to understand about the sleep cycle. See, your barbiturate, they are going to have a sleep dose response curve, steep dose response curve. So, as you are going to increase the dose, as you are going to increase the dose, with a minor increase in the dose itself, they are going to reach the 100% concentration and they are going to cause coma. Whereas your benzodiazepam, they are going to have a flat dose response curve. What is flat dose response curve? It takes a longer doses to attain the 100% concentration. It requires more amount to attain the 100% concentration. Whereas your barbiturates is going to have a steep DRC. Now can you tell me which is going to easily go into toxicity? Whether it is going to be a barbiturates or whether it's going to be a benzodiazepam, which is going to easily enter into a toxicity. Remember, anything that is going to have a steep DRC will be having a narrow therapeutic index. Whereas anything with a flat dose response curve will have a high therapeutic index or wider therapeutic index. So remember, your benzodiazepam will have a wider therapeutic index. Whereas your GABA mimetics, that is going to be a barbiturate, will have a narrow therapeutic index. This you need to remember. If it is a narrow therapeutic index, you need to give the drug with the utmost caution. Whereas wider therapeutic index, you can give increased dosage. There won't be any problem. Now coming to the sleep cycle, this is going to have a more disturb. Okay, more disturbances in the sleep. That is going to be a barbiturate. Whereas this is not going to disturb your sleep cycle very much. So which sleep cycle is going to be affected? Remember, both your barbiturates as well as benzodiazepam, it's going to decrease the stage 3, stage 4 and REM sleep. Whereas it is going to increase the stage 2 of the sleep cycle. Next, coming to the abuses and tolerance, you are going to remember there is a more abuses uh, tolerance in your uh, benzo barbiturates, whereas they have less in, uh, tolerance or less abuse potential, which one benzodiazepam. Now, coming to the toxicity, I told you that your uh, barbiturates are going to have a narrow therapeutic index. That means toxicity is more in case of a barbiturates, whereas your benzodiazepam is going to have a narrow, it's going to have a wider therapeutic index Index. That is the reason why they have less toxicity. Now coming to the treatment of toxicity. So if it is going to be a barbiturates, you are going to give a uh, you are going to give a antidote. There is no specific antidote. You are going to go for NaHCO3 bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate alone. But when it is going to be a benzodiazepam, what is going to be the drug of choice? What is going to be the drug you are going to give in case of benzodiazepam? You are going to give flumanazil. So remember, flumanazil is going to be the drug of choice in case of a benzodiazepam toxicity. Whenever there is going to be a benzodiazepam toxicity, what is going to be the drug of choice? 
the answer is going to be flumanazole. Next, is there any cytochrome P involvement? Remember, there is going to be a cytochrome 3A4, 3A, cytochrome 3A4 involvement that is going to be present in the uh, benzo barbiturates. Barbiturates can induce cytochrome P3A4. Remember, barbiturates can induce cytochrome P3A4. So, therefore, it is going to increase the ALA synthetase and that is going to cause acute intermittent porphyria. Very good, Abdul Barbiturates. That's right. So, it's going to cause a acute intermittent porphyria. Whereas in your benzodiazepam, you don't have a specific microsomal enzyme inducers. So, therefore, they are not going to be a problem. Now, I have told five important differences between your barbiturates and benzodiazepam. What are the differences I told you? First, start with your barbiturates. Barbiturates are going to be a GABA bimitic. They are going to have a narrow therapeutic index. They are going to have an increased toxicity. Number three, what is number four? We are going to have more disturbance in the sleep cycle. What is number five? There is a more abuse potential or more tolerance. What is the number six? Microsomal enzymes are going to be there. Cytochrome P3A4. Therefore, it causes acute intermittent porphyria. That is going to be about your barbiturates. Now, moving on to talk about the benzodiazepam. Remember, benzodiazepam is a GABA facilitator. They are going to increase the opening of the GABA channel. And second point is they are going to have a wider therapeutic index. Therefore, they are going to have a less side effect. What is the antitoad in your uh, benzodiazepam? Antitoad in your benzodiazepam is going to be flumanazole. And what is going to be your sleep cycle? Here, yeah, there is a lesser disturbance in the sleep cycle. And what is the other point we discussed? There is going to be abuse potential for the benzodiazepam. For the newly joining students, just listen. We are just discussing. We have started with the GABA channels. So, I have just discussed about what are the subunits of GABA. Then, I have told the basic difference between barbiturates and benzodiazepams. Now, I am going to move into the usage of barbiturates followed by usage of benzodiazepam. What is the usage of your barbiturates? Barbiturates are more commonly uh, ultra short acting for theopenton. You remember theopenton sodium. We call it as theopenton sodium. They are used as induction of anesthesia. You have a separate topic in your Tara Shenberg. So anesthesia alone is the best book is going to be a Tara Shenberg. They give you in a four or five pages entire anesthetic agents. Okay. So that is going to give you a brief idea about the anesthetics like your induction pre-anesthetic medication. In pre-anesthetic medication, we will be giving anxiolytic group of drugs and all those things. And it is also going to be helpful for induction of anesthesia. Which one? Theopenton sodium. Okay. So, they are going to be ultra short acting drugs. So, they are going to be having a redistribution. Why? Because they will be redistributed in the tissue. VD is going to be very high for your theopentan. That is the reason why you are going to have a ultra short acting. Then, what are the long acting barbiturates? Your phenobarbiturates. Barbiton. You have phenobarbiton and primadone. Phenobarbiton is going to be an important drug of choice in case of subtle seizures. Subtle seizures are going to be the most common neonatal or infant seizures. Neonatal or infantile seizure. Most common neonatal and infantile seizure is going to be a subtle seizure. What is going to be a drug of choice in subtle seizure? It is going to be phenobarbiton and phenobarbiton. Okay, now coming back to the benzodiazepam. That's all about barb uh, your barbiturates. Barbiturates, you are going to have, that's all. That's all regarding your barbiturates. Once again, I repeat, you are going to have your theopenton sodium. You are going to have your phenobarbiton. You are going to have phenobarbiton barbiton then you are going to have your uh, primadone so even in your tripathi uh, textbook uh, what is the classification given barbiturates are divided into long acting short acting ultra short acting ultra short acting like you are going to have theopenton and methoxetone then in the short acting they have given two drugs buto barbiturate pinto barbiturate and then about your long acting it is going to be your phenobarbiton so if a question asked in any of these drugs what you are going to do i initially told you certain important points regarding your barbiturates right all those points regarding your barbiturates then with specifically if they ask you theopenton sodium you know what is theopenton it's a ultra short acting just relate with ultra short acting you are going to mention it as ultra short acting and uses is going to be induction of anesthesia 
anesthesia clear right now moving on to discuss about the benzodiazepam so benzodiazepam it is divided into hypnotic anti anxiety anti convulsants if you are going to see in your uh, tripathi textbook they have divided into anti convulsants hypnotic and anti anxiety let's start with the anti epileptic drugs so anti epileptic la first one you have to know is status epilepticus i am not going in detail about status epilepticus it will be read in your uh, pediatrics later on in your medicine later on but you have to remember this whenever a patient is going to come to you with seizure in your opd when you are going to be in casualty the first thing you are going to do is you are going to give mid lorazepam follow or your midazolam but the drug of choice is going to be your lorazepam remember status epilepticus within 5 minutes or uh, more than 5 minutes when the patient is coming to you you are going to start with lorazepam as a drug of choice if, you, if lorazepam is not available you can go for midazolam or clonazepam lorazepam clonazepam midazolam they are going to be the drug of benzodiazepam clonazepam Lorazepam, lorazepam, diazepam, clobazam. All these are the drugs of anti-convulsants, anti-epileptic drugs. Okay, if the patient is not going to regain the consciousness or if the patient is not going to have a stopping of the seizures or again if there is a recurrence of seizure, then what you are going to do? You are going to go for the second drug that is going to be a phosphenitoin. Even after phosphenitoin, after giving for 5 minutes, the patient is not going to have any improvement. Then you will give IV phenobarbital or valproate even after that if the patient is not recovering you go for propofol unfortunately even after that if the patient is not recovering you go for a complete general anesthesia so you are going to give you are going to give keto relax okay you are going to give ketamine you are going to start with sevoflurane desflurane all these general anesthetic drugs you can start it and you can uh, go we can just make them into venti mechanical ventilation clear right so this is going to be your status epilepticus what is status epilepticus when the patient is going to have more than 5 minutes of seizures or when the patient is going to have uh, the second time of seizure within 30 minutes of recovery from the first seizure then you are going to consider it as a status epilepticus what are the drug of choice for that lorazepam followed by uh, midazolam or clonazepam and if the patient is not improving you go for a uh, phosphenitoin even then if the patient is not improving you go for phenol barbiton or valproate even after that patient is not recovering you go for propofol propofol do you recover agalana you go for general anesthesia so you are going to go for your sevoflurane desflurane and all those general anesthetic drugs and you are going to put the patient in the mechanical ventilation is it clear this is all about your status epilepticus number 1 Number two, if the patient is going to have a febrile seizure, remember in febrile seizure, it's going to be a diazepam. Diazepam you're going to give by rectal root or midazolam by nasal root. This is going to be the drug of choice for your febrile seizure. Third one, anxiolytic. When you want to remove the anxiety. Okay, so what is going to be the drug of choice for anxiety? Can someone tell me what is the drug of choice for anxiolytic? We have already seen one anxiolytic previously. What is that anxiolytic drug we saw? If someone can respond, maybe everyone are new, I think. Where people haven't joined from the previous class. I think they are tired from morning to evening. Remember, anti-anxiety drug, you have performance anxiety. If the patient is going to have a performance anxiety, you go for a beta blocker. If it is going to be a generalized anxiety disorder, you go for a drug named generalized anxiety disorder, you go for a drug named buspiron. What is the mechanism of action of buspiron? This I have taken already in the first session of your CNS. But anyway, I am repeating because everyone are new here. Buspiron, it is going to be a... 5-hydroxytryptamine 1A receptor. It is a 1A agonist. So this is going to be acting like an anxiolytic. This is an anxiolytic drug. So apart from that, you can also go for your benzodiazepam like your lorazepam, clonazepam. All these drugs are also going to act as a anxiolytic drugs. They are the drug of choice in case of panic attack or generalized anxiety disorder. Third one, central activity muscle relaxants. So diazepam. Diazepam acts as a muscle relaxant, centralized muscle relaxant. And in a daycare surgery, if you want to give sedation, you cannot go for a general anesthesia and all. You can just go for midazolam. You can go for renazolam. Midazolam, renazolam, they will be having a, a sedation only for a shorter duration. So far, therefore, any daycare surgery, you can actually administer midazolam. Next, alcohol withdrawal. So now what happens? The patient is going to be having a... Hey, can you tell me what is that named? Alcohol withdrawal leading to seizure. Can you tell me what is the named alcohol withdrawal leading to seizure? The, what encephalopathy you will have? 
So what encephalopathy, what psychosis you have in alkalosis? Do you remember what type alkalosis and what uh, you will be having in the encephalopathy? Do you remember? You have Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korofkoff psychosis, psychosis. Korofkoff psychosis. These are the two things happens when there is alcohol withdrawal. Don't worry, I'm going to talk about alcohol withdrawal shortly. So in alcohol withdrawal, what happens? I'll give you an example. So first day, when you're going to withdraw the patient from alcohol, first what happens? You will have a tremens, the tremor that is called as your generalized body tremor will be that that you call as delirium tremens. So first patient will have starting with delirium, the patient are tremens, the patient will be shouting. But what happens if you are not going to continue to give for one to two days alcohol for the patient and when you're going to lock up inside a room, what happens? Slowly the patient may go into seizure, slowly patient may go into unconsciousness. So that is a very, very important. So when in the alcohol withdrawal, when there is a seizure episode, you are going to start with the lorazepam and chlordiazepoxide. So chlordiazepoxide, you are going to start with the lorazepam when there is an alcohol withdrawal seizure. And when there is alcohol withdrawal along with liver failure, even in that case, what is the drug of choice? You are going to start with lorazepam. So hope you will remember. Now coming to the insomnia. So drug of choice in insomnia is going to be your Z drugs. So you have something called as Z group of drugs. What is the Z group of drugs? These are some non-benzodiazepam drugs. So what are the Z group of drugs? Write it down. Z drugs are nothing but these are the non-benzodiazepam group of drugs. So first Z is called as your Zopiclone. Zopiclone. And you have Zalipam. You have Zalipam. Then you have your Zolpidem. You have Zolpidem. You have your yes Zopiclone. You have yes Zopi clone. So these are going to be the Z drugs which are present. These Z drugs is also going to act very typical similar to that of your benzodiazepam. So even in the receptor where it is going to sit is going to be very similar to that of your benzodiazepam. It is also going to sit at the alpha gamma junction. But remember even though it is going to be present in the alpha gamma junction unlike your benzodiazepam your Z group of drugs is going to stimulate only your alpha 1 subunit. It is going to stimulate only your alpha 1 subunit that is a very important point you are going to remember next moving on to discuss about the moving on to discuss about the side effects of your benzodiazepam remember benzodiazepam is going to have an important side effect that is going to be your anterograde amnesia so they are going to be having an anterograde amnesia so that is going to be caused due to lorazepam so do you all remember there is something called as rape drug what happens? You have flunitrapism. You are going to have your lorazepam. What happens is whenever a girl goes to a party, in the party what happens? There is an antisocial guy who is mixing up this drug along with the drink. When he is mixing up that along with the drink, what happens? That girl will be forgetting. She will become unconsciousness as well as she will start to forget the recent uh, whatever happens. Like the, uh, from the time of administration of this drink, she will be starting to forgetting things. That is called as anterograde, anterograde amnesia. So this is used as a rape drug. So your lorazepam and flunin, uh, flunitrazepam, flunitrazepam, both are uh, going to be acting as a rape drug. This is the most commonly used as a drug for the antisocial guys who is undergoing a sexual uh, harassment and rape. Okay, wow. so that is a very important, this is a very, very, very commonly asked question in your Viva. Viva was like, okay, the question the most common is going to be your rape drug. So I want you to remember this. Next, they are not safe in the liver failure. All your benzodiazepam are not safe in the liver failure except LOT. What is that LOT stands for? L stands for your lorazepam. O stands for oxazepam. X O stands for oxazepam and T stands for Temazepam. So T stands for Temazepam. So what are the drugs which are safe in the liver failure? Again, repeat along with me. It is going to be Lorazepam number one. It is going to be Oxazepam number two. It is going to be Tenazepam number three. Lorazepam, Oxazepam, Tenazepam. Lorazepam, Oxazepam, Tenazepam. These are going to be the three drugs which are actually going to be safe in the liver failure. So why? Because these three drugs are going to excrete by urine. Whereas your uh, other drugs 
which are present in your benzodiazepine they are uh, they are excreted by the bilirubin by the liver therefore it is a dangerous for administering those drug while while there is a liver failure now coming to the z drug why do you give z drug basically those five drugs i told you right zolpiclone yes zolpiclone zolpidem zaliplon and etizolam these five drugs are basically having a minimal abuse they have a minimal distortion of your sleep cycle and they have only sedation action they don't have anterograde amnesia they don't have anterograde amnesia anterograde amnesia that is the very important reason why you are avoiding your benzodiazepam and you are going to give z drugs so remember in that zolpi clon is going to be a uh, shortest acting whereas zolpidem is going to be having a quick onset of sleep so this is a very important you if you on tomorrow morning you are going to have a exam you are having a insomnia you are you are not getting sleep but tomorrow morning you have to wake up early so i cannot uh, get a, i cannot take a risk for administering benzodiazepam because when i am going to take benzodiazepam what happens i will be going into a prolonged period of sleep there will be a late uh, awakening so that's why what we have is we have a z drugs this z drugs can be taken in a late night without morning sedation so zolpidem can be taken late night without morning sedation so this you can give for a patient who is telling that they are having insomnia and they have to wake up early morning they have important work then you can go for your zolpidem is it clear then you have your yes zolpidem yes zolpidem so yes zolpidem is also going to be a long acting so zolpidem
made is a very good attempt. What is the next one? Valproate. Excellent. Valproate is also going to be a sodium channel blocker. What is the next one? Can you recollect the next one? Ethoxyamide. It is going to be a valproate. Zonisamide illa pa. Zonisamide illa. Zonisamide illa. Vera, vera. Zonisamide is not going to be a... Is it? Okay. Vera, some other thing. Remember? Ethoxyamide. Valproate is correct. Any other? That is going to be your valproate. And what is the third drug? GABA pentin, excellent. So you're going down GABA pentin. These are the three drugs. In that, we will be giving ethoxyamide and valproate for the absence seizures. We have a classification when it is less than three year child, you go for ethoxyamide. When the child is going to be more than three years, you go for valproate. This is what your uh, uh, your uh, Arison textbook tells. Okay, so absence seizures, it is going to be called as petit mal seizure. Child less than five to ten years, there will be a starring episode. So the patient will not have any other lesions. They are going to be symptoms. Their patient is going to have a starring episode. EEG will be showing three earth spike and wave pattern. So what is three earth spike and wave dome pattern? So what is that is? In ECG, you are going to have increase three earth. Still three earth is going to increase. Then there is going to be a spike. Then there is a wave. Then there is a dome pattern. Like this you are going to have. This is called as your three wave. This is called as your uh, three earth spike and wave dome pattern. So it is going to be three V. Okay, this is going to be your three earth spike and wave dome pattern. There is going to be three earth spike and wave dome pattern. So now coming to if it is a pure AS. Okay, you're going to give ethoxyamide. If it is a atypical AS, you can go for lapro valproate more than lamotrigrin or topiramate. So remember, you should never give carbamazepine, phenytoin, vigabatrin, tiagabin, gabapentin. Any drug that is going to involve in the inhibitory neurotransmitter like your carbamazepine. Okay, carbamazepine is a sodium channel blocker that you are not going to give. Phenytoin, again sodium channel blocker, you are not going to give. Vigabatrin, it is a GABA transaminase inhibitor, you are not going to give. You are not going to give GABA reuptake inhibitor. All these drugs will be worsening the symptom. The only drug you are going to give in the uh, in your absence seizures is going to be calcium channel blockers. You have to remember that. Now, coming towards the next one, that is your sodium channel blocker. So, it is going to block the inactive state of sodium. So, it is going to block your sodium channel in the inactive state. So, your, the first drug is going to be of phenytoin. How you are going to remember the features of phenytoin just with their uh, mnemonic phenytoin. P stands for pseudo lymphoma. So the side effects of your phenytoin is going to be P stands for pseudo lymphoma. That is going to be your lymphadenopathy. H stands for hypertrophy of gum and hypersensitivity reaction. E N stands for anemia. The anemia, megaloblastic anemia. So just remember anemia or anemia. Okay, wow. so you're going to have anemia, megaloblastic anemia due to antifolate mechanism. And Y stands for young female. So young female, especially who is going to have acne, hirsutism. So they are going to have acne, hirsutism when they are going to consume this phenytoin. And what does T stands for? Teratogen. So you're going to have fetal iodontoin syndrome. Cleft lip, cleft palate, microcephaly, digital hypoplasia will be occurring. O stands for osteomalacia. IN stands for inhibit the insulin release and causes hyperglycemia. Clear, right? So these are going to be the features of your phenytoin. Now coming to toxicity. Phenytoin more than 20 microgram per ml. Okay, so 20 ton when there is going to be 20 microgram ml that is considered as toxicity. So cerebellar symptoms, you have cerebellar symptoms, ataxia or diplopia. So you are going to have ataxia, diplopia. These are the cerebellar features you are going to have when there is going to be more than 20 picogram per ml. Now you have to know what is capacity limited kinetics. So low or moderate dose. This phenytoin, when it is going to be given in the low or moderate dose, they are going to follow first order kinetics. When this is going to be given in the higher dose, they follow zero order kinetics. Can you tell the difference between first order zero order kinetics? In first order kinetics, T of will be remaining the same. Uh, same uh, percentage of concentration is inhibited. Uh, it is going to be uh, excreted in every T of. Whereas in zero order kinetics, uh, per same amount of drug will be excreted for every uh, uh, every metabolic reaction. So that is what we for every T of. That is what we call it as a uh, first order kinetics and your zero order kinetics. For example, if I am going to give 100 mg of drug for every, uh, if T of of the drug is going to be the T of percentage, okay, it's going to be uh, releasing uh, 
okay to, uh, in the first t of if 100 mg is going to be converting into 50 mg then there is 50 percent of drug which is released every uh, t of that means that 50 percentage is going to remain constant so from the 40 mg now it has become 80 mg and 40 mg 40 mg and 20 mg 20 mg and 10 mg and the mother coming at ever that is called as your first order kinetics whereas in zero order kinetics it's a fixed amount for example if it is a 20 mg is going to be the uh, t of zero it's going to be the amount that is going to be excreted then zero order kinetics what happens so for every t of 20 mg is going to be released as a constant 20 mg is going to be excreted as a constant that is going to be your zero order kinetics hope you are clear with what is a uh, first order kinetics and what is zero order kinetics now carbamazepine so this is all about your phenytoin then you are going to have carbamazepine carbamazepine is also going to be a sodium channel blocker it is a dose related so they are going to cause ataxia diplopia they will be having a adh like action whenever there is a adh like action what happens they will be causing siadh what is siadh can someone tell me in the chat box what is siadh what is siadh can someone put in the chat box let me see who is going to tell siadh can someone tell what is siadh syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion so that is going to be your siadh this is going to cause siadh okay clear okay very good now coming towards the idiosynchronic action so Remember, the idiosynchronic action is going to be less in the ox carbamazepine. So, from the carbamazepine, we have this development of ox carbamazepine. But the problem of this ox carbamazepine is they have more ADH like reaction than your carbamazepine. But what are the advantages? They are going to have less rashes, they have less bone marrow suppression, they are going to have less hepatitis, less symptoms compared to that of your carbamazepine. Then, third one is going to be SLE carbamazepine. SLE carbamazepine is going to be OD drug they can they are going to be a drug of choice in partial seizures and they are drug of choice in the terminal trigeminal neuralgia they are going to be a yeah, important group of drug which is used in the bipolar disorder yes literary carbamazepine what are the new group of drugs zonisamide zonisamide is going to cause renal stone remember zonisamide is going to cause renal stone what is rufinamide rufinamide is going to be causing lenox gastrot syndrome we will be using rufinamide now the question is what is lenox gastrot syndrome lenox gastrot syndrome is a, it's a type of uh, syndrome that is going to occur in the child a patient is going to have a low iq multiple type of seizures will be present and the eeg the patient is going to have a slow wave less than 2.5 hertz always the hertz will be less than 2.5 hertz slow waves you are going to get that is going to be your lennox gestalt syndrome what is a drug of choice in lennox gestalt syndrome it is again going to be valproate more than trimoxin lamotrigine rufinamide cannabinol and then your topiramate all can be given but what is a drug of choice in ketangana it's going to be valproate it is going to be valproate so that that's what you are going to remember that's a very important next what you are going to remember is after this you are going to go for after this you are going to go for the valproate remember in valproate valproate is a broad spectrum uh, because it is going to cause a sodium inhibition it's going to cause inhibition of t type calcium channel and they are also going to raise your gaba action they are also going to raise your gaba action therefore this is present in the seizures so you are going to use this in seizure all type of seizures let it be gtcs let it be your absence seizures atonic seizures myoclonic seizures in all type of seizures you will be using valproate more than lamotrigine more than your levetiracetam carbamazepine is only used in case of your partial seizures or focal seizures clear right then myoclonic seizure you are going to have a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy you have juvenile myoclonic epilepsy you are going to have something called as valproate remember val juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is seen in the adolescence morning elbow jerking will be there in pregnancy if you are going to have this juvenile myoclonic seizure you are not going to give valproate because valproate is going to cause a what does your valproate cause can you tell me what does your valproate cause what is going to be a teratogenic action of your valproate what is the teratogenic uh, action of your valproate? It is going to cause 
neural tube defect remember valproate is a very important thing it is going to cause neural tube defect and it is because of folic acid deficiency therefore you are going not going to give this in pregnancy you are going to give lamotrigine or your levetiracetam what is the drug of choice lenox gestalt uh, syndrome and in case of atypical absence seizures in case of bipolar disorder valproate is a drug of choice and it is going to be an important treatment in migraine attack. So what are the side effects of your valproate? Remember, the side effects of valproate are what a plan. Remember, what a plan. W stands for weight gain. Okay. EH stands for hormonal disturbances. H stands for hormonal disturbances. In which hormonal disturbances? Estrogen. What it is going to be? PCOD. And A stands for ataxia. T stands for tremor. A stands for alopecia. P stands for pancreatitis. L stands for liver toxicity. And A stands for rise in ammonia. Okay. And N stands for neural tube defect. Can you repeat along with me? Once we will see with read with seeing. And then we will memorize without seeing. What a plan. W stands for weight gain. H stands for hormonal disturbances. A stands for ataxia. What is your T stands for? T stands for tremor. And what is your A stands for alopecia? P stands for pancreatitis. L stands for liver failure or liver toxicity and your A stands for ammonia rise and N stands for neural tube defect. How can you prevent the, how can you treat the rise in ammonia level? You are going to give L-carnitine. L-carnitine is a treatment of choice for rise in ammonia. Whereas again NTD, neural tube defect, what is going to be your treatment of choice? You are going to give folic acid. How much folic acid? So if it is going to be a preconceptional, preconceptional, that is pre-pregnancy, you are going to give 400 microgram, 0.4 mg per day and if it is going to be after pregnancy you are going to ask the patient to stop valproate and continue 4000 microgram per day 4000 microgram per day again in valproate also you have one exemption so if the valproate level of consumption is going to be less than 5 mg you are going to ask the patient to continue if the patient is taking more than 5 mg you are going to ask the patient okay to shift to left triazetam because what happens is the patient will be coming to you only at the 6 weeks or 7 weeks of pregnancy. That time already she is continuing taking valproate. So you, now you cannot do anything. But if at all, if the, uh, if the patient is going to come to you at 3 weeks or 4 weeks of pregnancy or when preconceptional, what you will do? You will ask the patient to stop valproate and you are going to shift the patient to left triacetam. You are going to shift the patient to left triacetam. Is it clear? Next we are going to move towards the okay so with this we are completing the entire central nervous system are you are clear with central nervous system hope you are clear with central nervous system a very very important topic is central nervous system once you complete the central nervous system next we will be doing towards the endocrinology okay copy this i'll give you a one minute break just one minute okay now it is 22 19 at 22 21 10 21 we will start with the endocrine and we will end at 11 o'clock sharply after completing the endocrine pharmacology is it clear if you have any doubt till now, you can post it in the uh, comments in the chat box so that I will be answering your doubts. If you have any doubt, post it in the chat box. I will be answering your doubt. If you want any page to be copied, you let me know. I will just uh, show that page so that you can copy it down. Hope everything is clear till now and you don't have any doubt till now. Right? How is the class? Everything is okay, right? The speed... Uh, the way which is uh, which I am telling the notes which I have prepared if you have any problem any doubt or any uh, suggestion clarification you can just post me either in the chat box directly I don't uh, worry if you are going to post any negative or positive everything is fine and then if you want to PC me also you can just uh, give me a personal message so that I will be just uh, finding the way how to correct it and how to help you out so ultimate aim is helping you out that's all so ultimate aim of these sessions is going to be helping you out before your exam. See here, uh, today we have completed central nervous system. Today we have completed uh, and all your, uh, okay, what to tell? We have completed your, the big chapter, antimicrobials. These two are the very big chapter apart from your ANS. Now, since we have completed these two uh, topics, ANS, I will cover it tomorrow. So now you can be very confident in going for your pharmacology exam. 
okay i am very confident that you will be writing good once you are going to listen to it and once you are going to prepare notes from this okay let me move towards the endocrinology this is a very important topic here you are going to discuss about diabetes mellitus then you will be discussing about your thyroid hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism then we will be discussing about the androgen anti androgen and we will be discussing about your uh, clomiphene citrate induction ovulation induction drugs then we will discuss some amount of uh, some topics like your selective estrogen receptor modulator and your uh, tamoxifen like this we will be discussing very short chapter this is so that is what we are going to discuss in the next half an hour so let me start with the diabetes see why there is a diabetes what is the problem either there, there is going to be hyperglycemia why there is hyperglycemia either there is going to be decrease the insulin or there is going to be insulin resistance if there is a problem with the release of insulin we are going to supplement the patient with insulin directly or if the patient is going to have insulin resistance, then what you can do, you can actually play the base how we can overcome the insulin resistance. There are only two important drugs you have. Number one is going to be your insulin. Number two is going to be your oral, hypergly hypergly oral hyperglycemic drugs. So we have oral anti-diabetic drugs or you can go for insulin. Okay, just put a tabular column. Just take a tabular column like this. So insulin is a very discovered by Benetting and Best. Very important. Insulin is even this. Who discovered insulin is asked as a question in your entrance exam. Need PG exam. So you cannot leave this question alone. So other discoveries can be thrown in the dustbin. But the discovery of insulin alone is very important. You should never forget. It is Benetting and Best. Okay. And who discovered the structure of insulin? That is going to be a Frederick Sanger. Okay, wow. so now coming to the types of insulin. Just put a tableau column with times, onset, peak, duration. Type, onset, peak, duration. First one is going to be your ultra short acting insulin. The first one which we are going to discuss is going to be your ultra short acting insulin. So for ultra short acting insulin, what are the examples of ultra short acting insulin? The examples of ultra short acting insulin are number one, it is going to be your aspart. You are going to have glucin, you are going to have lispro. Aspart, glucin, lispro. These are the three ultra short acting drugs. So what happens? Onset is going to be 15 minutes peak attains at one hour and total duration of action is going to be four hours. So when you have to give this ultra short acting insulin just before the meals, just before the meals to control the postprandial hypoglycemia. Now just imagine and tell me for all the meals throughout the day. So morning breakfast, before that one puncture, before the lunch, one puncture, before the dinner, one puncture, before your evening snacks, one puncture. Will the patient comply with you? Will the patient feel comfortable when you're going to puncture him repeatedly before every meal? No, right? So you have to find what are the other things, what, what are the other mechanisms we can go for. Then they discovered this short acting insulin or we call it as a regular insulin. So this regular insulin is called as a soluble insulin. This can be given in the patient. Okay. This can be given twice a day. Okay. Just before the breakfast and just before the dinner, if you give, that's okay. That is called as short acting insulin. So, but what happened, you know, in short acting insulin, when the patient was given, there was a problem of hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. There is no constant maintenance of your glycemic control in the patient with short acting insulin. So that is going to be your short acting, short acting insulin is going to be your, it is going to prevent postprandial hyperglycemia, not hypoglycemia. It is going to control postprandial post hyperglycemia. It is going to control postprandial hyperglycemia. Clear, right? Okay, so now you're going to have short acting insulin, which is going to be your regular insulin. You're going to have 30 minutes P onset peak is going to occur in two hours and duration is going to be for eight hours. So then what happened? This had some problem. So they moved on towards a long acting insulin. So long acting was an intermediate acting insulin they called. In the intermediate acting insulin, you called it as a lente insulin. What is lente insulin? It is going to have 30% of, okay, same uh, short acting insulin. It is going to, uh, it is going to contain 30%, it is going to contain 30% of semi-L. Okay, and it is going to consist 70% of ultra L. What is semi L and ultra L? So semi L is semi lente, ultra L is ultra lente. Semi lente is going to act quick and amorphous in nature. Whereas ultra lente, it is going to be a crystalline structure and they are going to act for a longer duration of action. So it is going to solve dual purpose. When I am going to give in the morning, it is going to your semi L, which is going to act for the immediate postprandial hyperglycemia is prevented. 
then you are going to have your ultra L, which is going to prevent for the longer duration is going to act. So this was helping so, uh, for a certain extent. Uh, so one hour, four hour, and it is going to have action till 16 hours. So they started give this in the BD by dosage. But what happened? This was also a problem. Okay, this also had a problem with the patient's complaints. Then came the long-acting insulin. Remember, what are the long-acting insulin? Glargin, Detimer, Deglutec. So, Glargin, gl you have your Detimer and you have your Deglutec. Okay, what is this? So, these are nothing but they, your Glargin cannot be mixed with uh, any other drug because your Glargin is going to be acidic in nature. Others, everyone, they are going to be long-acting that they don't have something called a speak. They will be constantly maintaining the blood uh, level of insulin so that it is going to be for a longer duration of action. Okay, that is going to be your long acting. See here what happens in the long acting. So when you're going to have a plasma, what happens is when you're going to give long acting group of drugs. Okay, long, uh, when you're going to give long acting, this is going to be your, uh, when you're going to give, this is going to be an insulin level. Okay, so plasma insulin level, you're going to give a ultra short acting. When you're going to give ultra short acting, there's a short raise, then again it is going to fall. Then there is going to be a short raise, then again there is going to be a fall. Short raise, again there is going to be a fall. This is what happens when you're going to give a ultra short acting or large intermediate acting insulin. But when you're going to give a long acting insulin, what happens? It is going to raise, okay, and it is going to maintain a constant level. It is going to maintain a constant level in the body. So do you see any peak here? No, you are not going to see any peak here. They are going to maintain a constant level of insulin. So this level of insulin will be equal or will be more than that of your, uh, okay, in other insulin groups, more than that of your other insulins, it will be maintaining. This is going to be your long acting insulin. Now coming to the usage. What are the uses of your insulin? It is going to be a drug of choice in case of your type 1 diabetic mellitus. It is going to be a type 2 diabetic mellitus. It is a drug of choice in case if the oral drugs are not able to control or if you're going to have a pregnancy or any surgery or any trauma before they wanted to reduce that and you have to maintain the glycemic control then you are going to start with the insulin number one number two in diabetic ketoacidosis so diabetic ketoacidosis especially occurring due to type 1 diabetes mellitus more than type 2 diabetes mellitus you go for regular insulin iv remember this point here only your regular insulin can be made as a iv infusion regular insulin is the one only insulin which can be taken for a IV infusion. Clear, right? So you can go for a IV infusion. So 0.1, M, 0.1 unit per kg bolus you are going to give us an infusion. Now coming to hypercalcemia. Hyperkalemia. So in hyperkalemia, you are going to give insulin because this insulin is going to send the potassium from the blood into the cell. So that is why this is going to be uh, used in the hyperkalemia and also in the salbutamol can be used in case of hyperkalemia. What are the side effects? Side effects are hypoglycemia. What are the side effects? Side effects are hypoglycemia, number one. Number one, the patient will have hypoglycemia. Number two, lipogenesis. There will be a lipogenesis. Okay, so there is also going to be a dystrophy, lipogenic dystrophy in the site of infection, site of your injection. Third is going to be a hypokalemia. So again, I told you, right, this is going to push the potassium from the blood into the cell. Therefore, there will be a reduction in the blood level of potassium leading to hypokalemia. Fourth one is going to be a weight gain. Now, moving on to talk about the oral anti-hyperglycemic drugs. So, we are going to have something called as oral anti-diabetic drugs. So, how we are going to remember oral anti-diabetic drugs, oral anti-diabetic drugs. So, you all know the institute called as DAMS. Remember, DAMS TBCD. So, this is how I remember. Okay, though you will all remember it by using mechanism itself. You are all intelligent. But remember, just for a safety, what you are going to do? You have to remember the group of drugs which you are going to cover by this oral anti-hyperglycemic drugs. So DAMS TBCD. What does D stands for? D stands for DPP4 inhibitor. What does D stands for? DPP4 inhibitor. What does A stands for? Alpha glucosidase activator alpha glucosidase activator what does m stands for m stands for meglitinide meglitinide and what does s stands for sulfonyl ureas s stands for sulfonyl ureas and what is going to be a t stands for t stands for 
Theolidinidion. Theolidinidion. What does B stands for? B stands for biguanide. B stands for biguanide. What does C stands for? C stands for your co-transporter inhibitor. C stands for co-transporter inhibitor. Which co-transporter? SGLT2 inhibitor. What is your D stands for? D stands for D2 agonist. D stands for D2 agonist. Copy this down. This is how we are going to remember. These are the eight group of drugs which you are going to remember. These eight group of drugs is divided into three mechanisms of action. What are the three mechanisms of action? Number one, either it is going to increase the insulin secretion. Okay. Either you are going to increase the insulin secretion or you are going to increase the glucose loss. In the urine, no, in the or mulama, glucose and area will let go. Or third one is going to be increase in the insulin sensitivity. What are the three group of drugs you're going to remember? Number one, increasing the insulin secretion, excretion. Okay, secretion. Number two, increasing the glucose excretion. Number three, increasing the insulin sensitivity. First one, let's see which are the drugs that are going to cause insulin secretion increase. Number one, sulfonyl ureas and meglutinide. Both the sulfonyl ureas and meglutinide, they are going to cause opening of the, or they are going to cause a blocking of your potassium channel, potassium ATPS channel, which is present in your uh, pancreas, beta cells of pancreas. When you are going to inhibit the potassium channel present in the beta cells of pancreas, that is going to cause increase in the insulin release. But what is the problem you are going to get when there is an increase in the insulin release? They may cause hypoglycemia. But in the patient already diabetic, you are going to give sulfonyl urea or meglutinate. And the patient is going hypoglycemia. So that is the least, least occurring side effect. Okay. What are the sulfonyl ureas you know? Can you tell me? It is going to be a tolbutamide. Glibenclamide, dolbutamide, glibenclamide, you have glipizide, you have glicazide, you have glimipiride. Among this, glimipiride is a drug which we are commonly using. A very, very commonly used drug is going to be your glimipiride. Or the first drug which is used in sulfonyl ureas, they are going to be your chlorpromamide. So they are going to be your chlorpromamide. Let's see one by one. First, the second thing is going to be your meglutinide. Meglutinide, you are going to have one day two drugs. One is a natiglinide, repaglinide. Natiglinide, repaglinide. Both are going to have a quicker action. So when you are going to give it before the meal, they are going to effectively control the postprandial glycemic control. And they are very safe in the renal failure. Okay, now moving on to talk about the sulfonyl ureas. Do you remember? I told about this chlorpropamide. Chlorpropamide is going to be causing a disulfiram-like reaction. Did we read? Yes. So so they are also going to cause prolonged hypoglycemia and they are going to cause a ADH like action that is going to be SIADH. Can you recall and tell me which is the other drug which caused the ADH like reaction? What is the other drug which we read caused the ADH like reaction? What is the other drug which is also starting with C? Can you tell me in the chat box the drug which is also starting with C where we had uh, where we had uh, uh, digging ADH like reaction causing SIADH. Excellent. It is going to be a carbamazepine. So carbamazepine is also the drug that is going to cause ADH like reaction. Here you are going to have your uh, chlorpropamide which is also going to cause a ADH like reaction. Excellent answer. Then second generation drugs. You are going to have your glimipiride, you have your glipizide, gli you are going to have glibenclamide. What are the side effects of it? Weight gain is one of the side effects and hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is very common in the first generation rather than the second generation which has the least side effects. Now coming to the incretin therapy. The second therapy which you are going to give is incretin therapy. Incretin therapy, na, 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 you are going to have something called as GLP-1 action, agonist. We are going to have something called as GLP-1 agonist. Let's see what it is. Very easy. So what you are going to do here is you have something called as L cells in your intestine. What happens? This L cells will be releasing peptide hormone. This peptide hormone is called as glycogen-like peptides. So this glycogen-like peptides, when it is going to be present, when there is going to be a glucose, what it does, this glycogen-like peptides, it is going to break down your insulin level. So it is going to break down your blood glucose level. When there is going to be a blood glucose level, what happens decreasing? It is going to cause a decrease in the blood glucose level. It is going to cause increase in the insulin level and it is going to cause decrease in the glucagon level. So that we are harvesting, that action we are harvesting. Now what happens? We have something called as GLP-1. Okay, this GLP-1 is broken down by the dipeptidyl peptidase 4. 
in the glp1 is very much necessary for include increasing the insulin and your blood glucose level are decreased pandrathukku you are going to have this the P glp1 which is very much necessary what is glp like glucagon like peptides so if you want to inhibit this okay if you wanted to break down this glp1 you need dipeptidyl peptidase 4 appa namak glp1 nariya venumna either we can go for a glp1 agonist or we can go for a inhibitor of dipeptidyl peptidase 4 so what are the drugs that are going to inhibit the dipeptidyl peptidase all your gliptin group of drugs all your gliptin group of drugs like your citagliptin you have your vildagliptin you have linagliptin all the gliptin group of drugs they are going to be called as dpp4 inhibitor dipeptidyl peptidase 4 okay so how to remember this i usually remember like this but if you want you can remember it in any way tenali sa sita alone in lanka village i remember like that tenali sa sita alone in lanka village t stands for your tenigliptin s stands for your citagliptin and inur s stands for your saxagliptin and your a stands for your uh, alogliptin l stands for your linagliptin and v stands for vildagliptin so this is my way of remembering i don't ask you to remember the same you can remember in either way possible but try to remember at least very sorry very sorry there was a disturbance in my network hope i am audible now hope i am audible now am i audible guys can someone confirm in the chat box hope i am audible there was a problem with my network hope i am audible yes right okay see so here you have this either you can actually increase the glp1 or you can inhibit this dipeptidyl peptidase 4 dipeptidyl peptidase 4 is going to be your uh, gliptin group of drugs so now you know what are the gliptin group of drugs clear right so what are going to be the side effects of your gliptin group of drugs they are going to cause they are going to be not gaining a weight gain weight loss but they will be causing nasopharyngitis there's a high chance of developing a nasopharyngitis with the gliptin group of drugs now coming towards your uh, glp1 agonist remember the glp1 agonist will also cause weight loss they are going to decrease the appetite and they are going to delay the gastric emptying they are going to delay the gastric emptying this is a very important now coming to the side effects of your glp1 agonist number one pancreatitis number two cancer thyroid number one pancreatitis number two in the cancer thyroid number three it is going to be present in the gastroparesis you can also it is also going to be causing gastroparesis so you are going to avoid it so remember side effects pancreatitis ca thyroid you are going to have your uh, pancreatitis ca thyroid gastroparesis and weight loss so since weight loss is there you can use it in the obesity so obesity la or drug i use pannalam liraglutide semaglutide remember this was a question asked in the inicet 2023 november just one month before they asked it so what was the question is what is the drug of choice in patient with and diabetes and obesity the answer is going to be your uh, liraglutide liraglutide is a drug of choice in the patient with uh, obesity as well as diabetes next you are going to have your tirzipatide what is tirzipatide tirzipatide that is going to be again glp2 agonist so they are going to be glp2 agonist okay wow. so they are going to promote the intestinal growth like glp1 we are going to have glp2 so what it does it is going to promote the intestinal growth okay now for first topic we have completed that is going to be the increase in the insulin secretion next what we are going to do we are going to increase the glucose loss how we are going to increase the glucose loss so
be synthesized by your FSH by your Leydig cells. So now what happens in that you are going to have something called as 7 17 alpha hydroxylase. That is a very important hormone for synthesis of testosterone. Now you have testosterone. But testosterone has a very less potency. So you wanted to convert it into dihydrotestosterone, which is going to have more potency. Who is going to help in the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone? That is going to be by 5 alpha reductase. You have testosterone that is going to get converted into 5 hydrotestosterone, dihydrotestosterone, 5, 5 alpha reductase. Now, dihydrotestosterone, what happens? It is going to go into the prostate. Okay, dihydrotestosterone is going to go into prostate. So, prostate la dihydrotestosterone is going to function. Okay, wa. now your, what happens is, when it is going to go and act in that prostate, what happens? That is going to cause increase in the size of your prostate. Prostromegaly will occur. Now, what you want to do? In the prostate hypertrophy, when you are going to inhibit this step, when you are going to inhibit this dihydrotestosterone into prostate, how dihydrotestosterone goes and act in the prostate in the androgen receptor. When you are going to inhibit this androgen receptor, that will help in the decrease your benign prostate hypertrophy. What are the drugs that are going to act as an androgen receptor inhibitor? Repeat along with me. Number one, it is going to be flutamide. Number one, it is going to be flutamide. Number two, bicalutamide. Number two, bicalutamide. Number three is going to be ciprati acetate. Number three is ciprotiron acetate. Let me repeat along with me. Again, fluma, flutamide. Number two is going to be a bicalutamide. Number three is going to be a cyperator, cyperatiron acetate. Okay. So, your flutamide is going to be apatotoxic in nature. Bicalutamide is going to be a, uh, it is going to be Okay, so it is also going to be a sulfur containing drugs and then you are going to have your uh, ciperatone acetate. So, bigalutane is a very safe drug. Okay, ciperatone acetate is also used in the CA prostrate. Remember, you also can inhibit this 5-alpha reductase. When you are going to inhibit this 5-alpha reductase, what are the drugs? Finasteride and Deutasteride. This Finasteride is going to helpful in the BPH. It is also helpful in case of alopecia. So alopecia, when you are going to give Finasteride, that is going to be helpful. That is going to be helpful in the growth of the air. But what is the side effects? They are going to have a sexual side effect. The problem with it is they are going to cause a erectile dysfunction. That is a problem which is going to be there. Now coming towards 17 alpha hydroxylase. So the drug which is going to inhibit the 17 alpha hydroxylase is abiterol acetate. You can go for abiraterone acetate. It is going to be your CA prostate. You are going to have this drug that is going to be inhibiting your 17 alpha hydroxylase. Now you have completed the use of your uh, all the drugs that are going to be your anti-androgen. Now uh, your gondotrop in releasing hormone. This gondotropin releasing hormone can be given either by pulsatile or by continuous. If you are going to give it in the pulsatile manner, what happens? They will be raising your FSH LH. This is going to be causing testis stimulation, ovarian stimulation. So, in case of infertility treatment, you can give a pulsatile gondotropin releasing hormone in case of delayed puberty or your sexual infantilism. If the patient is going to have a continuously given with your uh, uh, GNRH, what happens? It is going to inversely inhibit the testis and inhibit the release of FSH and LH that is going to inhibit your testis and ovary. So this is given in case of precocious puberty, fibroid endometrioma, endometriosis, infertility and you can give in the CA breast and your CA prostrate. In case of CA breast and you can give in the CA prostrate. Now coming to what are the side effects? Initial tumor flare. So worsening will be there. So this can be prevented by adding flutamide to it. So you can add flutamide to it. Now you can also go for subcutaneous or IM route. What are the drugs which are going to be a gondotropin releasing hormone agonist? Gosarelin. Anything that ends with relin. Gosarelin, busurelin, Triptorelin and nephirelin. N stands for nasal. So nephirelin is a nasal drug. Nephirelin is a nasal drug. All this comes under the group called as luprolide. Luprolide is a gondotropin releasing hormone agonist. Now, what are the drugs that are going to be gondotropin releasing hormone antagonists? Gondotropin releasing hormone antagonists is subcutaneously you can give relics group of drugs. So when it is a relin, if it is a relin, you go for IN. IN stands for your, it is going to be a gondotropin releasing hormone. What is EX? 
ex or ix stands for exit so it is going to be a inhibitor hormone so what are the gnrh antagonist digar relix oval re relugolix so all stand ends with ix okay wow. so the use is going to be in ca prostate again there is no initial tumor flare you have gani relix you have centro relix this gani relix and centro relix is used as a iv okay so we're going to use it as a iv infusion you're going to use it as a iv infusion now coming to the last one that is going to be your selective estrogen receptor modulator this will be the last topic selective estrogen receptor modulator we will try to complete by 11 20 selective estrogen receptor modulator you have something called agonist and you have something called as antagonist so what is agonist and what is antagonist just put the heading organ estrogen tamoxifen roloxifen just put a heading like this organ estrogen tamoxifen roloxifen just put a heading like this so breast so what happens in the breast your estrogen is going to cause proliferation okay tamoxifen roloxifen are going to be selective estrogen receptor antagonist how it is going to go it's a modulator it can act both as agonist and antagonist depending upon the organ which is involved for example in the breast estrogen is going to cause proliferation of breast whereas your tamoxifen and your roloxifen is going to act as an antagonist so what is the use of it in case of ca breast you are going to give tamoxifen roloxifen they are going to act as an antagonist though they are going to be a selective estrogen receptor modulator they are not going to be same like your breast estrogen causes proliferation in your breast but whereas tamoxifen proloxifen will be causing inhibition of your growth of breast okay wow. so that is very important the side effect is going to be cataract than retinopathy the side effects of your tamoxifen and roloxifen is going to be cataract and your retinopathy now coming to the second organ that is going to be in bone remember in bone your estrogen causes mineralization similarly your tamoxifen also causes mineralization your roloxifen also causes mineralization but roloxifen has more mineralization than your tamoxifen use is going to be post menopausal osteoporosis and in case of uh, what is the side effect there will be increased heart flushing now coming to liver remember in liver there is going to be increase in the clotting factor in all three estrogen tamoxifen and your roloxifen so if there is going to increase in the clotting factor that leads to venous thromboembolism that will be leading to venous thromboembolism now coming to the uterus what happens in the uterus remember so your from your estrogen causes proliferation of your uterus tamoxifen which causes inhibition of growth in your breast is going to cause proliferation in case of your uterus but roloxifen here also it is going to cause inhibition so what is the drug of choice in case of ca breast with ca endometrium the drug of choice is going to be your roloxifen so you cannot give tamoxifen because tamoxifen though it is going to inhibit your ca breast they are going to increase the risk of ca endometrium then you have something called a selective estrogen receptor down regulator now what you're going to do you're going to just down regulate the estrogen receptor how do you down regulate the estrogen receptor very simple you have full v s strand so the drug name is full v s strand estrogen antagonist full is complete so you're going to have complete estrogen antagonist where will you use it we use it in ca breast what is the safety it has a wider safety margin it is not going to cause ca endometrium you can give once month uh, subcutaneously once a month subcutaneously then you have the drug called as clomiphene citrate clomiphene citrate is anti-estrogen on hypothalamus as well as your pituitary so because of that what happens there is going to be so usually what happens they are going to act as anti-estrogen your hypothalamus and pituitary therefore your hypothalamus and pituitary will be releasing more fsh and relh what is the use they are going to be helpful in an ovulatory infertility where because of an ovulation when there is going to be infertility there what you do you are going to increase the fsh lh activity that in turn is going to lead to increase in the ovulation procedure what are the side effects so uh, instead of releasing one ovarian follicle so because of a rapid rise in fsh and lh they can be multiple ovary that are multiple uh, east, uh, ovarian follicles that are going to be released by your ovary that lead to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome it can release multiple ovulation 
causes multiple pregnancy or in PCOD. So it's going to cause hyperandrogenism. So what is the drug of choice in hyperandrogenemia? You're going to give, uh, you're going to give OCP, OCP pills. So what happens in infertility, PCOD infertility? If they are going to be a PCOD, you're going to give letrozole. And if no PCOD, you're going to give clomiphene citrate. You're going to give clomiphene citrate. Now coming to the laparoscopic ovarian drilling is the, the surgical uh, choice for your uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Then you have aromatic inhibitor what is aromatase inhibitor they are nothing but you all know that a weak estrogen it is going to get converted into full grown estrogen by the presence of aromatase enzyme this aromatase enzyme when you are going to inhibit that will be reducing the estrogen level in the body right so that is going to be your aromatase inhibitor what are the drug East letrozole anastrozole eximetans so you have letrozole anastrozole and you have eximetans so they are going to be used in the ca breast and postmenopausal uh, women so that is going to be postmenopausal women so these are the drug of choice remember what are the side effects osteoporosis is a side effect so osteoporosis na na there can be an increase in the bone formation osteoporosis le enna agudhu there is a rise in the bone formation okay va so whenever osteoporosis there is a rise in the bone formation okay va how to rise your bone formation okay osteoporosis la enna nadakudhu rende rendu vishayam da one there is a increased destruction of bone there is a increased destruction of bone or there is going to be decreased production of bone decrease production of bone so for that what you have to do you have to decrease the resorption you have to give a drugs such that they are going to decrease the okay you're going to decrease the resorption and you're going to increase the production what are the drugs that are helpful in increasing your production teriparatide teriparatide is a recombinant parathyroid hormone this you can give subcutaneous daily for maximum two years that is going to have increased bone formation second thing is abeloparatide abeloparatide is again a recombinant parathyroid or hormone related peptide then you have romososumab romososumab is going to be antibody against your sclerotin sclerotin is antibody that is going to cause decrease in the bone formation so you're going to have a you're going to give an antibody that is going to act against sclerotin what is the answer romososumab so you have three drugs which is going to increase the bone formation teriparatide abeloparatide and you have romososumab a uh, teriparatide abeloparatide and romososumab teriparatide abeloparatide and romososumab so you are confident with what are the drugs that are going to cause increase in the bone formation now we are going to see the drugs that are going to decrease the bone resorption the first one is going to be your bisphosphonate this bisphosphonate what it does is it is going to cause apoptosis of osteoclast osteoclast are that uh, are the receptors that are going to cause bone destruction what your uh, uh, bisphosphonate does it is going to go and cause apoptosis of osteoclast itself because of that what happens you are going to have a alandronate ibandronate pamidronate zolandronate so first you draw all the parotid drug paratide or recombinant parathyroid hormone you have your romosumab romososumab is going to be antibody against clerotin now you are discussing about dronate group of drugs alandronate ibandronate pamidronate zolandronate just remember in the alphabetical order a i p z so in that a and i is going to be oral drug alandronate and ibandronate are going to be the oral drug whereas pamidronate zolandronate are going to be iv drug palandronate and pamidronate and zolandronate are going to be iv drug what are the uses remember you are going to give it in the osteoporosis patient for a treatment as well as your profile access you are going to give it as a drug of choice till 5 years of age add calcium also along with it and what are the drug of, do, do, drug of choice in the Paget's disease of bone and hypercalcemia profile access you can give IV saline plus furosemide drug of choice is going to be your BPN and fasting la you can give calcitonin IV can be given this is going to be your uses coming to the side effects number one hypocalcemia so they can cause decrease in the calcium level and most common is esophagitis very very important so in the esophagitis so you're going to have a hypocalcium this was actually asked as a question guys i don't know whether i included that in your uh, paper so maybe in the first paper i have sent you a mcq right in that in the first paper if you see 
I will tell you the question number two. Just note it down. There was a question in your exam paper in the GIT topic. So this question was under GIT. I am not sure where, okay, whether I am not sure with the question number. In GIT question, what they asked is they have actually given a they have actually given a case. In that case, what they were telling us, there is there is going to be. Okay, in that case, what they were telling us actually, there is going to be a uh, hyperparathyroidism, there is going to be esophageal cancer, there is going to be esophagitis, like your esophageal web, there is a beaking, in a pathology you would have red light, there is a peaking beak appearance. So everyone thought that as alopecia by seeing this peaking, okay, peaking pattern of your esophagus. But remember, this peaking pattern of esophagus is also seen in case of your hypo, secondary hyperparathyroidism or in your hypocalcemia, in your hypocalcemia, in your osteoporosis. You will have esophagitis that is very much looking like your alopecia. That will be very much, sorry, not alopecia, very sorry. Aclasia. It is going to be very similar to Aclasia cardia. It is very similar to Aclasia cardia. I will send you that question in the group after this session ends. So that is a very, very important question. So this, uh, okay, Aclasia cardia will be having a uh, the bird peak appearance in your barium unima. Even in hypocalcemia, which is going to be causing esophagitis, that will also have. So the, when there is going to be a huge increase in the, the intake of bisphosphonates, when you're going to increase in the intake of bisphosphonate, that will also lead to bird peak appearance esophagitis. How do you prevent? You're going to increase the plenty water intake and standing position, you're going to be there. And coming to the rare causes, it can cause osteonecrosis of jaw and femur shaft fracture. And you have something called a zolindronate. Zolindronate is again another type of your bisphosphonate. So this is going to be taken in an IV, IV route. So they are going to be uh, very acute renal failure and uveitis are going to be the side effects of it. Then comes your BPH. Remember, BPH, you are going to be contraindicating, okay, because they are going to, when there is going to be a creatinine clearance, okay, less than 30 ml per minute, this is going to contraindicate, you are going to contraindicate the giving bisphosphonates. Now coming to your donosumab. So what is donosumab? You are going to go, so you know that bromososumab is an antibody against sclerotin. We read right, antibody against your sclerotin. Similarly, here you are going to have a denosumab. It is an antibody that is going to act against your rank ligand. It is going to be an antibody that is going to be acting against your rank ligand. So it is going to cause osteoclast apoptosis. It is going to cause osteoclast apoptosis. Okay, so then we will be moving towards the calcitonin. You all know calcitonin is going to be something that is obtained from your salmon fish. What it does, it is going to cause hypocalcemic hormones. They are going to decrease your hypocalcemia. They are going to decrease your calcium level. They will be going to acting against your parathyroid hormone. Where will you use that? In case of your osteoporosis as a nasal spray and hypercalcemia, you can give this calcitonin. What is postmenopausal osteoporosis? In postmenopausal osteoporosis, due to the sudden decrease in the estrogen level, you are going to give roloxifen because roloxifen does not cause estrogen proliferation, does not cause a pro, a endometrial proliferation. Therefore, you are going to give roloxifen. And second thing is going to be uh, HRT. Okay, hormone replacement therapy can be given in these patients. Next, calcimimetics. So you have something called a sinacalcet and italcalcetide. So sinacalcet is a oral drug. Italcalcetide is an IV drug. So what are they going to do? They are going to be very similar to that of your calcium and they are going to help in building block of your bones. Okay, now coming to the parathyroid gland. Remember, use is going to be parathyroid when you will be giving. So it is given in secondary hyperparathyroidism due to end-stage renal disease or hypercalcemia in primary hyperparathyroidism. Vitamin D, you all know how the cholesterol is converted into a calcitriol, isn't it? This one is a very important, listen carefully. Cholesterol in the presence of scanlight, they are going to get converted into cholecalciferol. That is vitamin D3. This cholecalciferol is going to be converted into a calcitriol, okay? calcidiol in the presence of liver in the presence of uh, 25 ohd3 it is going to form now that is going to get converted into one alpha hydroxylase in the presence of kidney into calcitriol so now what is going to be the role of your vitamin d vitamin d is going to help in the bone growth now vitamin d deficiency will lead to rickettsia and osteomalacia what are the drug of choice 
where you are going to use the vitamin D3. Remember, a coli calciferol is used as a drug of choice in case of, in case of, okay, any vitamin D deficiency. How much you are going to give? First, 6 lakh, 60,000 international unit you are going to give per week for 6 weeks. Or you can go for 400 international unit per day. 60,000 international unit per week or 400 international unit you can go for per day. And what is the drug of choice? Calcitriol in your renal failure. In vitamin D dependent rickets A in a liver failure, you are going to go for calcitriol as a drug of choice. Now coming talking about your somatostatin. Remember somatostatin. So just put a tableau column like this. Source, action, use. Just draw a tableau column in your notebook. Source, action, use. Let me give you time. Okay, just put a tableau column. Last topic of the day. So we are just left with this acromegaly. You are going to be just left with this acromegaly. Just take it fast. You are going to complete it today. Somatostatin. Somatostatin, what are the thing? Source, action, use. You are going to discuss about the source, action, use. Source is going to be your hypothalamus. Action is going to be decrease in the growth hormone release, decrease in the thyroid stimulating hormone release. Growth hormone release and thyroid stimulating hormone release. That is going to be the action of somatostatin in hypothalamus. When there is a decrease in the growth hormone release, it leads to acromegaly. So in acromegaly, what you are going to do? You want to decrease the growth hormone release. Therefore, you are going to use this somatostatin as a drug of choice. Similarly, thyroid stimulating hormone secreting adenoma. You want to decrease the thyroid stimulating hormone. You are going to give this stomatostatin. Next, coming to the stomatostatin's role in the alpha cells of pancreas. This is going to release, you are going to decrease the release of insulin and glucagon. So, any malignancy occurring in your islet of cells, okay, it has insulinoma, glucognoma. So, in all these gluconoma, in all these conditions, that is going to be somatostatin is given for your alpha cell. Now, coming to intestine. So, this alpha cell reduces the secretions. So, it is going to be helpful in the secretory diarrhea, especially carcinoid syndrome. In carcinoid syndrome, okay, drug of choice is going to be terli present we can go for terli present and number three this is going to also cause vasoconstriction therefore in esophageal varices you are going to give somatostatin you are going to give somatostatin is it clear now you are going to have the somatostatin remember they are going to have a shorter duration of action you have some of the drugs which is going to be very similar to your somatostatin what are they octreotide and landriotide landriotide octreotide and your landriotide these are the two drugs which are going to have a longer T of longer duration of action. Now coming to the last topic that is going to be our acromegaly in your endocrine. Acromegaly the drug of choice is going to be your octreotide. I am once a day once a month and we can also go for peg B som ant. What is this peg B som ant? So it is going to be a som stands for the growth hormone. Ant stands for antagonist. Peg B som ant is a, a growth hormone antagonist. It is given as a subcutaneous route. Then oral drug of choices DA antagonist dopamine agonist that is going to be bromocryptin and gabagolin bromocryptin gabagolin I told right whenever there is an increase in the dopamine uh, agonist it is going to cause decrease in the prolactin it is going to cause decrease in the prolactin very important point so dopamine agonist you have your hypothalamus dopamine pituitary this do what happens is this dopamine when it comes and acts in the pituitary that is going to cause decrease in the prolactin decrease in the growth hormone bromocryptin it is a short acting side effect is going to be increased nausea vomiting cabergolin again it is going to be long acting and it has a decreased nausea and vomiting. Therefore, we will be going for gabergolin than your bromocryptin. They cause us hyperprolactinemia, acromegaly. So, what are the side effects? Psychosis, okay, history of mental disorder. Psychosis and there is going to be a history of mental disorder. The side effects is going to be psychosis. So, you are going to contraindicate in the patient with a, a mental disorder. So, with this, we are completing the endocrine. Yes. So now we are going to complete with the next topic. We are going to continue with the next topic that is going to be your anticoagulant. So let me talk about this anticoagulant. Same hematology. Basically, you want to know antiplatelet group of drugs and anti uh, coagulant group of drugs. These are the two important drugs as far as your uh, as far as your uh, hematics group of drugs is concerned. So when you're going to look into your Tripathi textbook under the heading hematics, they are going to give you this iron drugs. Vitamin B12, adjuvant hematics. So that is the one part. And then you are going to have your coagulants, anticoagulants. 
antiplatelets you will be having anticoagulants antiplatelets and procoagulants these are the three headings which they are given and fibrinolytics fibrinolytics is one of the questions that is asked in the short note questions regularly even when i was writing my uh, university exam the question asked in the university in pharmacology was fibrinolytic group of drugs so fibrinolytics is always a odd uh, place where the exam where there is going to be a increased uh, to increase the chance of asking you in the exam then you have something called as hyperlipidemic drugs so these are the three drugs that comes under your uh, hemantics so we are not going to discuss iron in detail because you are going to discuss iron always in other drugs so now you are going to remember just regarding iron if you want me to tell some uh, few important points remember iron is going to be given as a oral as well as a parenteral iron when you're going to ask me what are the parenteral iron it is going to be iron dextran furous uh, sucrose ferrous sucrose and ferric carboxy maltose these are the drugs that are given in the parenteral group then what are the drugs that are given in the oral iron you are going to have your ferrous sulfate ferrous fumarate ferrous gluconate ferrous succinate ferrous amionate ferric ammonium citrate ferric hydroxy polymaltose and carbonyl iron and iron calcium complex these are the oral group of drugs these are the oral group of drugs which you are going to remember now this comes to the end of your iron so i don't want any other things that you need to remember in your iron okay so they can just ask you what are the parenteral iron give me for example of parenteral iron in the mandi kekkaradhu mattum da iron la nindha the questions that are going to come but what is going to be important is next anticoagulants so that the next important topic is going to be your anticoagulants we will learn about anticoagulants then we will go to the antiplatelet drug then we will also talk about we will also talk about the next one that is going to be your fibrinolytic drugs we will also talk about fibrinolytic drugs these are the drugs which we are going to remember today hope you all will remember it so can we start with the anticoagulant yes now starting with anticoagulant remember the drug of choice anticoagulant is going to be a drug of choice in case of a venous thrombosis antiplatelet is a drug of choice for arterial thrombosis the first point i want you all to remember anticoagulant is going to be the drug of choice for your venous thrombosis and anticoagulant is going to be a drug of choice in case of your antiplatelet drugs okay va wow. is a drug of choice in case of arterial thrombosis okay now let's see a quick revision on the coagulation pathway you have something called as intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway is nothing but so first there is going to be activation of 12 into 12a by the contact of your uh, when there is going to be a contact of this factor 12 into the surface endothelium of the blood vessel that converts your 12 into 12a this 12a converts your 11 into 11a 11a converts your 9 into 9. 11a is going to convert what it is going to convert your 9 into into 9a now this 9a is going to convert your factor 10 into factor 10a this is called as a intrinsic pathway then we have something called as extrinsic pathway in extrinsic pathway what we saw there is going to be a extrinsic pathway whenever there is going to be injury to your uh, injury to your blood vessel there is going to be a release of tissue factors this tissue factors is going to convert the with a uh, seven into seven a seven a is going to directly come and activate your ten into ten a now you have ten a this ten a is going to convert what it is going to convert your factor two into factor two a factor two a converts your fibrinogen into fibrin this is how the entire system acts now you have something called as unfractionated apparent this unfractionated apparent what is unfractionated apparent what is so called unfractionated apparent remember unfractionated apparent is nothing but that is going to inhibit both 12a they are going to inhibit your 11a it is going to inhibit your 9a it is going to inhibit your 2a unfractionated apparent is going to inhibit your 12a it is going to inhibit your 11a it is going to inhibit your 10a it is going to inhibit your 2a it is going to inhibit all the steps of your intrinsic pathway that is going to be your unfractionated apparent unfractionated apparent they are going to be heteropolysaccharides they are going to be heteropolysaccharides they are going to be the strongest organic acid 
said. What it does is, it is going to have a body, it is going to have a pentosacrid, it is going to have a tail. So what it does is, it is going to inhibit your, so this is going to inhibit what? It is going to bind with your 10A, it is going to bind with your 11A, it is going to bind with your 9A. So all that is bind. Pannadhi. Okay, 10A inhibition to the confirmed diagnosis pentasacrid. So 2A inhibition is going to be pentasacrid and it is going to be binding with your tail. Okay, that's all you want to remember. Okay, well, so they're going to bind with your antithrombin 3. They're going to bind with your 10A. It is going to bind with your 2A. Everything, this is going to bind. This is your unfractionated apparent. Okay, now coming to the low molecular weight apparent. Remember, they are the chemical polymers. Okay, they are going to be the chemical polymers. Okay, of the apparent. So, unfractionated apparent molecular. Then they are going to be a forming a polymer. That is called as low molecular weight apparent. Low molecular weight apparent. They are going to inhibit 10A more than your 2A. Then you have your Fonda Parinax. You have something called as Fonda Parinax. What happens to your Fonda Parinax? Fonda Parinax, they are going to inhibit only the 10A. So it is going to inhibit only your 10A, not 11A. Remember, low molecular weight apparent is going to inhibit 10A and your 11A. Whereas your Fonda Parinax is going to inhibit only your 10A. Whereas unfractionated apparent, they are going to inhibit 12A, 11A, 10A and 2A. 12A, 11A, 10A and 2A. But remember, your low molecular weight apparent, they are going to inhibit only your 11A and 10A. Can you tell me what is the importance of it? 11A, 10A, what does the inhibit part so they are not inhibiting your 2A. That is what I want to tell you. Now coming to the uh, difference between your unfractionated apparent, difference between your low molecular weight apparent and diffraction between your Okay, low molecular weight apparent. I'm getting the difference between your Fonda Parinax and uh, uh, you have your unfractionated apparent. Okay, so I'm going to divide your unfractionated apparent, low molecular weight apparent and Fondo Parinax. I'm going to divide the entire thing into three topics. Okay, unfractionated apparent, low molecular weight apparent and Fondo Parinax. What is unfractionated apparent? Unfractionated apparent, they are going to have inhibition of 10A, 11A, 12A, 9A. Everything is inhibited by your unfractionated apparent. Whereas your low molecular weight apparent is going to inhibit only your 10A and your 11A. 10A more common than your 11A. Fondo Parinax is going to inhibit only your 10A, not your 11A. Now, what is going to be the P of 2417? Remember like this, 2417. 2417 is going to be your P of and bioavailability is 30, 70, 30 plus 70 is 100. So, 2417, 30, 70, together it is going to be 100 percentage of Fondo Parinax bioavailability. Now, coming to the response, remember your, your low molecular, your, uh, your, uh, your apparent, okay, unfractionated apparent will be having a variable response. Whereas, there, these two are going to be having a predictable response. So, how you are going to monitor, it's very important to monitor APTT. Whereas, in here, there is no need of any monitoring. Use, we are going to use this in the hospitalized patient. Whereas, your uh, fond of parinex and low molecular weight apparent, you can use it even in the patient with, even you can use it in the patient who is going to be in IP as well as you are going to use it in OPD patient. You can use both in IPD patient as well as in your OPD patient. So that is an advantage. That is a very big advantage of what? That is a very big advantage of your. That is a very big advantage of your uh, your uh, low molecular weight apparent and fondo parinox coming towards your uh, RPA. That is going to be your what is going to be the use of it. So what is going to be the route of administration for a treatment? You will be using IV route, whereas for your prophylaxis, you route subcutaneous route in your low your uh, unfractionated apparent but remember in case of your uh, in case of your uh, low molecular weight apparent and fondo parinex you will be giving only subcutaneous route you will go for only subcutaneous route now coming to talk about now last we are going to talk about your uh, what are the side effects see side effects here yeah, you are going to have osteoporosis and you are going to have what is called as your hit what is it can someone tell me what is it what is called as it so what happens? HIT it in uh, apparent. 
heparin induced thrombocytopenia so they are nothing but heparin induced thrombocytopenia that is more with your uh, your unfractionated heparin than your low molecular and your fondoparinex okay so now coming to the dvt so dvt prophylaxis lab which is used low molecular weight is used what are the example of low molecular weight heparin remember inoxaparin delta parinex so you're going to have two drugs what are the two drugs you're going to have number one you're going to have your number one you're going to have your enoxoparin number two delta parinex so they have a better pk okay they have a no monitoring needed and they have better safety now coming to the ufs that is going to be unfractionated apparent they are preferred in renal failure patient and the patient with high bleeding risk so patient at high bleeding risk you go for a unfractionated apparent now moving on to discuss about the side effects number one bleeding okay they can have a increased bleeding they can have increased bleeding so what you can do you have to give a antidote what is the antidote you are going to give in a patient who have a increased bleeding because of heparin you are going to give protamine sulfate so what is protamine sulfate so they are going to be the basic drug they are going to be a chemical antagonist they are going to neutralize they are just going to neutralize your your unfractionated heparin than your uh, low molecular weight apparent then you have a problem which i already told you that is going to be a it that is going to be a apparent induced thrombocytopenia okay so there is a decrease in the platelet count there is a decrease in the platelet count so what you have to do is you are going to stop the apparent so patient may have history of apparent for at least five days so thrombus vena thr thrombus formation rico woman more than your men and profile axis you have to give what are the profile axis you are going to give you are going to stop all the apparent no platelet you are going to give drug of choices parenteral or direct 2a inhibitor drugs you are just going to give 2a inhibitor drug so this 2a inhibitor drugs you have two type of drugs number one Ag argatroban so argatroban or bivalirudin you have argatroban or bivalirudin do you know how they started with this uh, 2a inhibitor i'll tell you so what happened is from the leech saliva leech is there right so from that they took the saliva that is going to be having irudin this irudin is a 2a uh, this is going to have a 2a inhibitor no just uh, think and tell me in a dvt deep vein thrombosis if you're going to go for some ayurvedic college okay so there's ayurvedic college in chennai in your tambram you are crompet sanatorium if you're going to go there what they are doing actually is leech therapy what is the basic concept of this leech therapy understand that your leech therapy the leech saliva is going to have irudin that irudin is going to cause uh, in the anticoagulation so they are helpful in the deep vein thrombosis so that is going to be the basic concept which is used okay and in your uh, uh, apparent induced thrombocytopenia they are using this leech as a drug so now what they did is but if you do you think it is hygienic to put a leech and to uh, and uh, you're putting a saliva and that is going to cause no that is not a hygienic procedure because of that only what we are doing we are going to secrete we are going to synthesis a uh, we are going to synthesis a uh, very similar uh, synthesis, synthetic drug that is going to be your argatobran and your bivalirudin. Okay, then osteoporosis is going to be one of the side effects. Then there is a decrease in the aldosterone level causing hyperkalemia. Next is going to be a oral anticoagulant. Remember, what are the oral anticoagulant you have? Warfarin. Warfarin is going to be a coumarin derivative. Warfarin is a coumarin derivative. So, if you are a path of the low molecular weight apparent and other things they are anticoagulant now we are saying oral anticoagulant what is oral anticoagulant you are going to have warfarin remember this warfarin they are going to okay they are going to competitive antagonist of vitamin k they are just going to be the competitive antagonist to vitamin k so you have something called as clotting factor 27910 this 27910 is going to get gamma carboxylation in the presence of vitamin k so they are going to get activated when you are going to inhibit this vitamin k when you are going to inhibit the conversion of oxygen vitamin 
to reduced vitamin D. So vitamin K, oxidant to reduced vitamin D form. Okay, there is going to be a enzyme called as VKOR. What we are doing is we are going to inhibit this VKOR. So by inhibiting this VKOR, what we are going to achieve? By inhibiting this VKOR, we are going to achieve a uh, decrease in the vitamin K. So when there is a decrease in the vitamin K reduced level, there is no gamma carboxylation. When there is no gamma carboxylation, there is no activation of your uh, clotting factor 27910. That is going to lead to that is going to lead to decrease in the clotting factors. That is going to cause anticoagulation. Now, what are the acts in the liver? Okay, so in the liver, it is going to be only in vivo. They are going to block the activation of vitamin K dependent clotting factor. They are going to uh, block the activation of vitamin K dependent clotting factor. You have warfarin action. What is the warfarin action? Slow. Three days it is going to be. So remember, it is going to be for three days, there is going to be a mechanism of action. Use, you are going to have maintenance use. So now coming to the monitoring. So INR. Okay, monitoring, you are going to remember. INR, you are going to. And what is the resistance? You have PKOR polymorphism. You have to monitor the uh, ratio. What is INR? Does anyone know what is INR? Can you recollect and tell me what is INR? It's some ratio. What is INR? It is a ratio. Okay. What is INR? What is INR? It is going to be international normalized ratio. It's a measure how long it takes for your blood to clot. That is going to be your INR. Okay. So resistance, VKO or polymorphism will be causing a resistance. Now coming to the side effects, you are going to have bleeding. So you are going to give a antidote. Now you know that for heparin, antidote is protamine sulfate. What is the antidote for vitamin K? For vitamin K, the antidote is going to be phyto padion it's going to be a phytopadion that is a vitamin k1 okay wow. what is severe bleeding will be causing you have to urgently reverse so you're going to give a competitive inhibitor and you're going to give ffp so what is ffp so you're going to give a frozen plasma you're going to give fresh frozen plasma and teratogenic effect remember this warfarin is going to be a teratogenic in nature they lead to dysala syndrome Dysala syndrome. So what happens? There's a chondroplasia, chondrodysplasia punctata. So there is going to be a depressed nasal septum. There is going to punctuate calcification in the epiphysis by taking a X-ray. Okay, wow. so that's very important. Now we're going to move towards a purple toe syndrome. So that is going to be cholesterol embolism. So what happens? That is going to form a emboli and they are going to be present at the toe end and they are going to cause a uh, yeah, but they are going to cause a uh, purple embolism is going to go there and that is going to cause necrosis of the edge of your toe. Okay, then you are going to have warfarin skin nevis. This is only a protein C deficiency. Okay, warfarin is going to cause thrombosis in cutaneous blood vessels. Now coming to the drug interaction, number one, warfarin action, that is increased warfarin action is going to cause bleeding. Warfarin is not a safe thing. When I'm going to give cefepirazone, you know cefepirazone causes hypoprothrombinemia. Do you remember? When I'm going to cause hypoprothrombinemia, when I'm going to add again, if you're going to add your warfarin, that is going to increase the ble increased bleeding. Next, coming to the broad spectrum antibiotic like a tetracycline. So tetracycline, what happens? They are going to be causing a, all the cutaneous flora is killed. Okay, so because of that, there's a decreased vitamin K production. Then comes your cytochrome P3A4, erythromycin, ketoconazole, ritonavir. So they are going to be decreasing your cytochrome P3A4. Then comes your OCP. So remember, estrogen causes increase in the CF synthesis, clotting factor synthesis, decreases your warfarin action. Liver failure, there is a decrease in the clotting factor synthesis. There is going to be increase in the warfarin action. Then comes your direct oral anticoagulant so direct oral anticoagulant they are not slow onset so now problem which we have with your uh, oral anticoagulant warfarin is going to be they are going to be okay number one slow onset number two they need a constant monitoring number three there are many drug monitor interactions so in a direct oral anticoagulant what happens is there is no interactions there is no uh, monitoring needed and they are slow onset so this is uh, this is going to be seen in the direct oral anticoagulant they are going to be divided into two types 
direct anticoagulant 2A inhibitor, direct 10A inhibitor. 2A inhibitor is going to be dabigatran. So, what is 2A inhibitor? Dabigatran. Itarisuzumab. Dabigatran. When the dabigatran is going to be taken, what happens is sometimes they can go for a they can go for a problem. What? Bleeding. So, what is going to be the drug you are going to give to reverse the dabigatran effect? What is the drug you are going to give to prevent the dabigatran effect? The drug which you are going to give to prevent the dabigatran effect is number you are going to give idarizumab. You are going to give idarizumab. You are going to give idarizumab. Clear, right? Then you are going to have direct 10A inhibitor. What is direct 10A inhibitor, guys? So, remember 10A ban. Ban means inhibition. So, what is the ban? What are the group of the ban? Apix the ban. You have idox the ban. You have bivarox the ban. So, XA, BAN. XA stands for your 10A. BAN stands for inhibitor. Apiximab. Then you have your idoxiban. Then you have bivaroximab. All these drugs are going to be 10A inhibitors. They are going to be, what is going to be the antidote for this? Adixanet alpha. Adixanet alpha is going to be the antidote which you are going to pump. Okay, now coming towards the last one that is going to be your DVT or pulmonary embolism. Okay, what is the drug of choice? Remember, if there is a massive pulmonary embolism with a right ventricular dyskinesia, you go for the thrombolytic group of drugs. Thrombolytic, I'll tell you what is thrombolytic anyway. Otherwise, you go for an anticoagulant. Anticoagulant, you have apparent, you're going to have warfarin. Apparent, no stop after five days. Warfarin, you can continue. What is DOAC? That is your direct oral anticoagulant, apixipam or rivaraxipam. So they are cancer associated DVT. So low molecular weight apparent is a drug of choice. Then comes your stroke prevention in your AF. Stroke prevention in AF is going to be done by anticoagulant more than your antiplatelet. So we have something called as chart vas scoring system. So other we are going to see what drug you are going to use in case of a AF, atrial fibrillation, anticoagulant or antiplatelet. And when I am going to talk about this anticoagulant, you have a non-vascular and vascular. So if there is going to be mechanical heart plan, then you are going to use warfarin. If it is a non-valvular in nature, then you can go for direct oral anticoagulant. They are not safe in renal failure. Therefore, you are going to use warfarin in renal failure. You are not going to use direct oral anticoagulant in renal failure. If it is going to be with, again, if the patient is going to have a mitral valve stenosis, then you are going to go for a warfarin and you are not going to go for a direct oral anticoagulant. Now coming to the anticoagulant, how do we divide the anticoagulant? Already we discussed all the anticoagulant, just you are going to see how do we divide. We divide to parenteral and oral. Parenteral indirectly acting is going to be unfractionated apparent, low molecular weight apparent, fond parinax. So all this we differentiated by giving a tableau column. Then we have direct 2A inhibitor, bivalirudin and your argobatron. Then your argotrabon, argotrabon. And then you are going to have your oral, that is going to be a vitamin K, warfarin. Then you are going to have your DUA, direct oral anticoagulation, that is going to be a direct 10A inhibitor called as your uh, apixaban, adoxaban, rivaroxaban. Then you are going to have direct 2A inhibitor, that is going to be your dabigatran. Clear? Now we are going to move towards the next one, that is going to be your thrombolytics. Do you have any doubt till now? Do you have any doubt till now? If you have any doubt, you can post it. Do you have any doubt you can post it? Do you have any doubt till now? Okay, so with the note that you don't have any doubt, I'll move towards the next one. That is going to be your last part. That is going to be thrombolytics or fibrinolytics. So what is thrombolytics or your fibrinolytics? So you have something called as your plasminogen. You have something called as your plasminogen. Okay. By a thrombolytics. Here you are going to have plasminogen. That plasminogen is going to get converted into plasmin in the presence of with the presence of plasminogen activator. So what happens? Some are very specific to the fibrin. Some are going to be non-specific to fibrin. For example, your streptokinase, urokinase, there are fibrin non-specific. So streptokinase, urokinase, they have a side effect of allergy. Next, coming to your next one, that is going to be a fibrin uh, specific. So fibrin specific, there is going to be altiplase, tenectiplase. Altiplase is a recombinant tissue, plasminogen activator. Okay, you are going to increase this plasminogen activator so that 
more fibrins they are going to get uh, converted into a fibrate is going to get degraded into uh, degraded product so that is called as thrombolytic or fibrinolytic so alteplase the recombinant tissue plasminogen activator if you are going to give it as iv infusion 100 mg over 2 hours tnet place they are newer group of uh, okay uh, newer group of your plasminogen activator you can give iv bolus single dose 30 mg you can give that is inactive place we call it as tpa now what is the drug of choice so drug of choice in case of your massive pulmonary embolism in case of crv dyskinesia okay and in acute mi in acute mi non n stemmy and stemmy in n stemmy nvr throm never thrombolytic in n stemmy remember you should never go for thrombolytic okay wow. so in a n stemmy never go for thrombolytic you have to have this as a rule okay your n stem my in your acute m my you should never go for thrombolytic you are just going to do stem me so in the stem me time to pci when it is going to be less than 120 minutes you can directly go for you can directly go for percutaneous okay knee percutaneous injury needle you can put and you can go for thrombolytic okay percutaneous in, in, in uh, you can go for a uh, uh, interventions okay whereas if the time to do pci is more than 120 minutes so you will be giving thrombolytic then you are going to take the patient for percutaneous interventions clear what are the side effects bleeding so there is going to be a increase bleeding will be causing and uh, what is going to be your treatment i am going to give antifibrinolytics so bleeding la what is the treatment you are going to give antifibrinolytics when you are going to break down the fibrin when you are going to break down the fibrin okay so what happens that will be increasing your bleeding so that will be increasing your bleeding remember fibrinolytic when you are going to give in bleeding that is going to cause increase in bleeding therefore you should give antifibrinolytic what are the antifibrinolytic just two drugs okay one is going to be eaca other is going to be transexamic acid just two drugs transexamic acid and eaca then coming to your antiplatelet drugs so remember you're going to have something called as okay i'll just draw and show you so you're going to have your blood vessels whenever there is going to be injury to your blood vessel there is going there has to be a platelet aggregation so there's an injury to the blood vessels so when there is an injury to the blood vessels what happened so if this is going to be injury now your platelet has to come and attach so now what happens your platelet is going to come and attach the, for the platelet to come and attach, it has to attach through the von Willebrand factor. So it has to attach through the von Willebrand factor. A very, very important topic which you are going to understand. This is going to be a very important part in your hematology, in your pathology too. So pathology, Leo, the important question that they are going to ask you is going to be your this platelet okay how your platelets are going to come and sit and what is going to be the action how it is going to do so this question is repeatedly asked even in your pathology so it is a very important thing to understand so you have to understand how the entire system is going to work you're going to understand how the entire clotting mechanism your bleeding mechanism is going to work and what happens exactly so can you just study can we just recall see you're going to have an endothelial defect when you are going to have an endothelial defect, your platelet has to come and sit. For the platelet to come and sit, what happens? You need a von Willebrand factor. So you have something called as von Willebrand factor. You have something called as von Willebrand factor, which is going to be present in your uh, endothelium. Now what happens? Over this von Willebrand factor, there is going to be a platelet that is going to come and sit. This platelet, okay, this platelet is going to have a receptor called as GP1B. So you're going to have a receptor called as GP1B. This GP1B comes and sitting over the von Willebrand factor. Now what happens? Once it is going to come and sit, that is adhesion. Next what happens? It should aggregate your platelet. For one platelet to connect with the other platelet. For a one platelet to connect with other platelet. What do you need? You need GP. Okay. You need a receptor called as GP2B3A. You need receptor called as gp 2 b 3 a so now what you are going to have the first one gp 2 b 3 a inhibitor now when i am going to inhibit this gp 2 b 3 a what happens there is no platelet aggregation going to occur so this is going to okay inhibit the platelet aggregation so that is going to be your abziximab 
Tyrofiban, Ptfibatin, Fibatide. Ptfibatide is very similar to the disease in pathology which you have read. That is called as Glansman thrombosthenia. Thrombosthenia. This is a important uh, anti. You are you're going to have a uh, platelet aggregation pathology which you have. So there is going to be a defect in the GP2B3A because of defect in the GP3B3A. There is going to be a problem in the fibrinogen, fibrinogen aggregation. The problem in the fibrinogen aggregation. Now, how does this fibrinogen aggregate? So for a fibrinogen to aggregate, you need ADP. Okay, when this ADP causes conformational changes so that one, uh, one platelet can act uh, can sit on the other platelet and can cause aggregation. So either the problem can be present in the GP2B3A inhibition. So that is going to cause, example is going to be abziximab, tirofiban, eptifita, eptifibatide, eptifibatide, abziximab, so you have tirofiban and eptifibatide. Fibatide. So everyone will have your FIBA. So there is going to be aggregation of, aggregation is going to be banned here. Okay. Now you are going to have second one that is ADP receptor antagonist. So this is of two types. Either they can be irreversible or irreversible. If it is a reversible, you call it as GRELOR. Reversible, GRELOR. Okay. So it's going to be TICA GRELOR. It's going to be CAN GRELOR. TICA GRELOR, CAN GRELOR. They are reversible. Now coming to the irreversible, you are going to have ticlopidin, you are going to have clopidogrel. Ticlopidin, side effect is going to be decrease in the bone marrow suppression. That is going to cause bone marrow suppression. Then you have clopidogrel, clopidogrel, no bone marrow suppression. They are going to be a pro-drug. Okay, wow. so they will be produced as a pro-drug. Cytochrome P2C19 will be converting into active drug. So when you are going to have omeprazole, so this omeprazole is going to inhibit your two cytochrome P2C19. Therefore, when you get omeprazole along with your clopidogrel, what happens? There is going to be a failure of antiplatelet reaction. There is a failure of antiplatelet reaction. Remember that. Then you have your prasugrel. What is pragugrel? This is going to be, there is no need of cytochrome P2C19. It can directly act. So clopidogrel required cytochrome P2C19. But pragugrel does not require to a cytochrome P2C19. They have a faster onset and they have increased risk of bleeding. So it's a contraindicated in stroke. Remember, they are contraindicated in stroke. Next is going to be your aspirin. Remember, aspirin, there is a irreversible COX inhibitor. There is going to be irreversible COX inhibitor. You have to remember irreversible COX inhibitor. Okay. Okay, it is going to be a irreversible COX inhibitor. Okay, wow. so aspirin low dose 75 mg per day. Low, low, low dose 75 mg per day aspirin. You are going to continue even on the day of surgery. So there is no need to stop this aspirin. Then comes your Orapaxor. Orapaxor, they are going to be PAR1 inhibitor. Orapaxor, remember, this is one of the question I add in your exam. What is going to be a Orapaxor? Orapaxor are going to be, they are going to be PAR1 inhibitor. Remember, Orapaxor, Orapaxor are PAR1 inhibitor. Orapaxor, they are PAR1 inhibitor. Orapaxor, they are PAR1 inhibitor. Okay, wow. very good. Next, coming to your dipyridomol, pentoxyphylin, then you have xylartazole. They are going to be phosphodiesterase inhibitor. They are phosphodiesterase inhibitor. They increase the C amp, okay, um, uh, adenosyl monophosphate, and they are going to increase the, uh, decrease the aggregation factors. Now, finally, we are going to move towards the next question. That is going to be your hypolipidemic drugs. Can we move into hypolipidemic drugs? Yes. Continue with the next discussion that is going to be your hypolipidemic drug. So what are the hypolipidemic drugs? Okay, shall we continue? Shall we complete this hypolipidemic drug? The last part of your hematology that is going to be your hypolipidemic drugs. Remember statins, they are going to be HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor. They are going to decrease the cholesterol synthesis in the liver. They are going to decrease the cholesterol synthesis in liver. Okay, this increased LDL uh, receptors 
on the hepatocyte. So what happens? Your statins, they are going to enter, they are going to cause inhibit your HMG-CoA reductase. Usually this HMG-CoA reductase will be converting your cholesterol, producing your cholesterol. This cholesterol, what happens? They are going to be taken up by your LDL in the blood, the LDL receptors in the blood, so circulating chylomicrons. So they are going to have uh, interaction with your PCSK9 and inclycerin. So you have inclycerin. So all these are going to be present. Okay. So, okay. What we will do is we will cut uh, hypolipidemia from hypolipidemia. Let's try to discuss tomorrow in the next session. I don't want to delay this session further. So just you have your hypolipidemia left out. So we will start with hypolipidemia tomorrow. We will take anti-cancer group of drug. Hypolipidemia, anti-cancer group of drugs. And after compulsory completing anti-cancer, we will go with the autocoids. So after completing autocoids, we will go with your GAT, then with your renal, then with your cardiovascular system. Then finally, we can talk about this uh, general pharmacology and your uh, the last one that is going to be your, the last one that is going to be your, uh, your uh, ANS, autonomic nervous system. Okay. Thank you so much.